Most people aren't lucky or fortunate enough to stumble upon the right business, and the kinds of people who discover the right business are often those who are willing to go to a lot of trouble to find good opportunities. If the perfect business opportunity doesn't just fall into your lap, and actually, even if it does, you need to do some introspection to determine what type of business is right for you. The following questions can help you take an inventory of your business expertise and interests. You can get a piece of paper and treat these questions like a quiz if you want to. The answers you get will help you select the best possible business opportunity for you. What top three business skills have you displayed over your business career? Examples include sales, accounting, marketing, administration, writing, communications, quantitative analysis, hiring, training, employee motivation, product development, customer service, focus, delegation, accountability, attention to detail, and so on. In which business skills are you the weakest? Refer to the examples in the preceding bullet for ideas. Over your working history, including part-time and full-time jobs, what three jobs have you enjoyed the most and why? After listing three jobs, consider and list the reasons why you liked those particular jobs. During your working history, what three jobs have you enjoyed the least and why? Similar to the preceding question, consider and then list the reasons why you disliked those particular jobs. What are your top three overall personal skills? Examples include leadership, communication, intelligence, creativity, vision, cheerleading, invention and or innovation, listening, problem solving, counseling, and so on. If this were a perfect world and you could select the industry in which you'd like to spend the rest of your life, what would be your top three choices? Examples include sports, music, movies, art, finance, education, telecommunications, electronics, computers, medicine, architecture, agriculture, transportation, insurance, real estate, financial services, food and beverage services, apparel design and manufacturing, furniture and home products, outdoor products, printing, photography, chemistry, plastics, and so on. What three favorite hobbies or special interests of yours may be conducive to creating a business? Many people turn a hobby or special interest, such as photography, golf, or coin collecting, into a business. Given what you know about the retailing, service, manufacturing, and wholesale career choices, rank these four in order of desirability. When you can't think of an answer to one or more of these questions, ask your spouse or a couple of good friends for advice. Oftentimes, they know you best. Use these questions to help you inventory your skills, interests, and job history. The results should help stimulate the thought processes that will assist you in developing a list of businesses that may work for you. If, for example, your strengths and interests are in sales, you may want to consider a business where sales is the primary function of the business, manufacturer's representative, for instance. If you indicate that you have weaknesses in such areas as attention to detail, delegation, and administration, you may want to consider operating a business solo as opposed to one that requires employees. If you determine that over your job history, you didn't like those jobs where you dealt directly with customers, the retail business would probably not work for you. These questions are intended to help you take an introspective look at yourself and lead you to where you would logically fit in the broad spectrum of business opportunities. That's why we say you'll find no quick answers here, but rather an opportunity to jumpstart the narrowing down process. Come back to these questions several times over a period of weeks. Few people arrive at a solution the first time through. When considering a business opportunity, you need to answer the following questions to assure yourself that the business you're considering is the right one for you. Is it a business that suits your personality? Consider a retail business if you like dealing directly with people, don't mind keeping regular hours, and can handle being tied to one spot for long periods of time. The converse, of course, also applies. If you don't like dealing directly with people, 
keeping regular hours, or being tied to one spot for long periods of time, don't consider the retail business. Consider the service business if you like dealing with people, solving problems, and working in spurts and flurries. Consider a wholesaling business if you're a detail-oriented person, if you enjoy supervising employees, and if you don't mind risking the significant amount of capital that carrying and distributing inventory requires. Consider the manufacturing business if you're a quality-conscious and detail-oriented person who enjoys searching for solutions to such engineering-oriented issues as process and flow and quality control. You should also enjoy supervising employees. Within each of the four major business categories, you can get more specific and narrow down your choices to specific industries. For example, consider the financial services or accounting tax preparation business if you like working with numbers. Consider the restaurant or entertainment business if you don't mind working unusual hours. Consider a banking, telephone sales, or consulting business if you don't mind spending long periods of time sitting at a desk. Is it a business or product in which you have experience? Experience is the world's best teacher. If you don't have it, your competitors who do have it are bound to have a sizable competitive edge over you. 60% of successful business owners have gravitated to products or services in industries with which they were previously familiar. Is it a business you can afford? A service business is usually the least expensive of the four business categories to start, followed by retailing, wholesaling, and finally, manufacturing. Yes, you should take into consideration the amount of money you can borrow or find investors for when answering this question. Is it a business with too much risk? Can you live with the risk inherent in this business? Generally, the bigger the capital requirement, the larger the risk. Are you sure you're prepared to live with the risk of starting a manufacturing company? If not, consider becoming a service provider instead. It's more suited to the average pocketbook. If you have an idea for a new widget but don't have the resources to manufacture it, you can always outsource the manufacturing of it and then sell, service, and maintain it yourself. Is it a business in which you have a competitive advantage? Can you make, service, or sell your product better? If not, you need to ask yourself what will motivate your customers to work with you. If your answer is price, you're in trouble already, unless you've figured out a clear and high-quality way to create and deliver a product or service cheaper and better than the industry leaders. Is it a business in which you can become a specialist? There's power in being a specialist, and there's danger in being a generalist. Today's movers and shakers have learned a valuable lesson from past experience. Focus on doing those things you can do better than anyone else. When is the best time to start your new business? Should you begin your new enterprise when the economy is strong or when the economy is in a recession? Does the economy even matter? What economic forces should drive your decision? Forget the economy, folks. We won't come right out and say that the economy doesn't matter because depending on your niche, it can. But by and large, generally speaking, the economy doesn't matter. For instance, the best time to start a business can be when the economy is booming, because people are in a strong buying mode. But there are downsides to starting a business in booming economies, including the fact that unemployment is usually low, which means good employees are hard to find. Economic recessions can also cut both ways. The bad news about recessions is that consumers are wary buyers in recessions, and wary buyers mean low margins, and low margins usually mean low profits. But the good news is that recessions serve as sort-out time. That is, they sort out the weak businesses from the strong ones and allow the strong ones to survive and grow. As the weak businesses disappear, they leave in their place an opportunity for newer, stronger competitors to surface. The best time to start a business is when the timing is right for you and your niche. If you're prepared in terms of finances and experience, if the niche is right and available, and if you're passionate about what you do, the best time is right now. If you and the niche aren't prepared, the time is wrong. 
No economic indicators can tell you this. If your small business startup is like most others, you probably won't utilize outside capital, so bootstrapping will have to do. Bootstrapping sources emerge as the clear winner in the startup financing competition. When you think about it, the fact that bootstrapping is so pervasive and works so well makes sense. First, what better way to instill discipline and make things work efficiently than to have a limited supply of funds? Second, because you care deeply about risking your own money or that of family and friends, you have a powerful incentive to work hard and smart at making your business succeed. So take heart if you think that you need vast sums of cash to start a small business, or if you've been turned down, perhaps more than once, by outside sources of funding. The entrepreneurial traits of hard work, perseverance, and, yes, good old-fashioned scrounging can help you locate the money you need to start your business. If you're like us and most entrepreneurs, you can locate the funds you need to finance your startup by following these steps. 1. Take stock of your personal assets and liabilities. You should get your personal finances in order and determine where you stand in terms of common important goals such as retirement planning. Only then can you begin to determine what portion of your assets you feel comfortable using in your business. 2. Assuming that your parents and other family members are financially able to help, gingerly approach them. The family resource is appropriately known as relationship investing or relationship lending. Although relationship investing is a widely used resource for raising money, it's also the most potentially dangerous. Telling the bank you can't meet repayment obligations is one thing. Telling a close relative that you've lost his money is quite another. The good news is that you'll work that much harder to succeed when family or friends are involved. The bad news is that losing the investment can damage existing relationships. Proceed with great care and be clear with family and friends about the risks, including the risk that they can lose their entire investment if your business gets into trouble. 3. Ask friends, especially those friends who can bring expertise along with money to the table, to contribute to your business's startup. Be aware, however, that the risks involved when borrowing money from friends are similar to the risks involved when borrowing from family. The downsides can be just as painful. 4. If steps 1, 2, and 3 still aren't enough, Start looking for a, gulp, partner, or partners. Suffice it to say that partners are a roll of the dice. Make a good roll, and your business will prosper beyond what it can with you alone. Make a bad roll, and your problems can multiply. 5. When all else fails, look to outside resources, even though they're historically unlikely to fund startups. Look for angel investors before heading for the banks, the Small Business Administration, and small business investment companies. If your idea or concept is compelling enough, and if you are compelling enough, you may even consider approaching venture capitalists. Remember, after you've tapped your own resources, but before you begin probing family and friends, remember to tape the golden rule of bootstrapping to the middle of your forehead and then take a long look in the mirror. If you haven't come across it yet, the golden rule of bootstrapping is as follows. Do not do unto others until you've done unto yourself. Or, stated in words that apply specifically to your search for capital, if you aren't willing to risk your own money, why should other people, especially family and friends, risk theirs? Estimated Capital Requirement Worksheet Add all one-time pre-opening costs, such as legal fees, licenses and permits, utility and lease deposits, furniture and fixtures, inventory, leasehold improvements, logo, stationery, and signage, insurance, and so on. Your one-time startup costs. 2. Add your projected early-month consecutive losses from your profit and loss statement. Be sure to include debt payments, both interest and principal, the first part of your working capital. 3. Add the anticipated purchase of assets from your balance sheet 
for the first year. Equipment, inventory, furniture, and fixtures. The second part of your working capital. 4. Add the amounts from steps 1, 2, and 3. 5. Multiply the amount from step 4 by 0 0.25 to get your reserve. The percentage required by this reserve figure will vary depending on the experience of the person or persons starting and running the business. The more experienced you are, the lower the reserve has to be. The less experienced you are, the higher it has to be. A reserve of 25% represents our best guess as an average. 6. Add the amount from step 4 to the amount from step 5 to get your total capital requirements. This figure represents the amount of capital your business will require from all sources before startup. After you determine how much capital you need, the real hard work begins finding it. Outsourcing institutions, banks, the Small Business Administration, SBA, Small Business Investment Companies, SBICs, angel investors, and venture capitalists are not primary resources for startup capital. Why not? Because most of these outsourcers are looking for either significant collateral and operating history, as is the case with banks and the SBA, or a business in an industry with uncommon opportunities for return on investment, as is the case with venture capitalists. Angel investors are the most versatile of the outsourcing resources, but they're also the most difficult to find. Some outsourcers loan you money, banks, SBA, and others. Others invest their money, venture capitalists, some angel investors, and the like. Stated another way, some outsourcers are creditors, others are part owners. Remember, outsourcers, with the possible exception of SBICs, have a well-deserved role in the financing world. That role just doesn't happen to be at the startup stage, especially for first-time business owners. After your business has matured and has a track record, and after you have matured and have a track record, outsourcers may become a part of the financing game for your business. We hope you agree that getting your personal finances in order before you set up shop makes a lot of sense, but you have so much to do and so little time. Where to begin and what to do? This section provides a short list of the important financial tasks you need to undertake. Where do you stand in terms of retirement planning? How much do you want to have saved to pay for your children's educational costs? What kind of a home do you want to buy? These and other important questions can help shape your personal financial plans. Sound financial planning isn't about faithfully balancing your checkbook or investing in stocks based on a friend's tip. Rather, smart financial management is about taking a hard look at where you are, figuring out where you want to go, and making sure that you're prepared for occasional adverse conditions along the way. A process, incidentally, that isn't unlike what you'll be doing when you run your own business. The first step in assessing your financial position is giving yourself a financial physical. Start with measuring your net worth, a term that defines the difference between your financial assets and your financial liabilities. Begin by totaling up your financial assets, all your various bank accounts, stocks, mutual funds, and so on, and subtracting from that the sum total of all your liabilities, credit card debt, auto loans, student loans, and so on. Note, because most people don't view their home as a retirement asset, we've left your home's value and mortgage out of your net worth calculations. Personal property, furniture, cars, and so on doesn't count as a financial asset. However, you may include your home if you want, especially if you're willing to tap your home's equity to accomplish goals such as retiring. Now, don't jump to conclusions based on the size of the resulting number. If you're young and still breaking into your working years, your net worth is bound to be relatively low, perhaps even negative. Relax. Sure, you have work to do, but you have plenty of time ahead of you. Remember, ideally, as you approach the age of 40, your net worth should be greater than a year's worth of gross income. If your net worth equals more than a few years of income, you're well on the road toward meeting larger financial goals, such as retirement. Of course, 
The key to increasing your net worth is making sure that more money comes in than goes out. To achieve typical financial goals, such as retirement, you need to save about 10% of your gross pre-tax income. If you have big dreams or you're behind in the game, you may need to save 15% or more. If you know you're already saving enough, or if you know it won't be that hard to start saving enough, then don't bother tracking your spending. On the other hand, if you have no idea how you'll start saving that much, you need to determine where you're spending your money. After you calculate your net worth, categorize your liabilities as either good debt or bad debt. Good debt refers to money borrowed for a long-term investment that appreciates over time, such as a home, an education, or a small business. Bad debt, also called consumer debt, is money borrowed for a consumer purchase, such as a car, a designer suit, or a vacation to Cancun. Why is bad debt bad? Because it's costly to carry, and if you carry too much, it becomes like a financial cancer. If the outstanding balance of all your credit cards and auto loans divided by your annual gross income exceeds 25% of your income, you've entered a danger zone where your debt can start to snowball out of control. Don't even consider starting a small business until you've paid off all your consumer debt. Not only are the interest rates on consumer debt relatively high, but the things you buy with consumer debt also lose their value over time. A financially healthy amount of bad debt, like a healthy amount of cigarette smoking, is none. If you have outstanding consumer debt, pay it off sooner rather than later. If you must tap into savings to pay down your consumer debts, then do it. Many people resist digging into savings, feeling as if they're losing hard-earned money. Remember that your net worth, the difference between your assets and liabilities, determines the growth of your money. Paying off an outstanding credit card balance with an interest rate of 14% is like finding an investment with a guaranteed return of 14%, tax-free. Note, we recognize that some small business owners finance their small businesses via credit cards. And in some cases, because this debt would be investment debt, and investment debt is good debt, we feel this situation may be acceptable. If you don't have any available savings with which to pay off your high interest rate debts, you'll have to climb out of debt gradually over time. The fact that you're in hock without savings is likely a sign that you've been living beyond your means. Devote 10 to 15% of your income toward paying down your consumer loans. If you have no idea where you'll get this money, Detail your spending by expense category, such as rent, eating out, clothing, and so on. You'll probably find that your spending doesn't reflect what's important to you, and you'll see fat to trim. This process is similar to budgeting and expense management in business. Not being able to manage your personal expenses may be a telltale sign of your inability to manage a business. While paying down your debt, Always look for ways to lower your interest rate. Apply for low interest rate cards to which you can transfer balances from your higher interest rate cards. Haggling with your current credit card company for a lower interest rate sometimes works. Also, think about borrowing against the equity in your home, against your employer-sponsored retirement account, or from family. All options that should lower your interest rate significantly. Before you address your longer-term financial goals, you need to make sure that you're properly covered by insurance. Without proper insurance coverage, an illness or an accident can quickly turn into a devastating financial storm. Buy long-term disability insurance if you lack it. This most overlooked form of insurance protects against a disability that curtails your greatest income-generating asset, your ability to earn money. If anyone depends on your employment income, buy term life insurance, which, in the event of your death, leaves money to those financially dependent on you. Make sure that your health insurance policy is a comprehensive one. Ideally, your lifetime benefits should be unlimited. If the policy has a maximum, 
it should be at least a few million dollars. Also, check your auto and home policy's liability coverage, which protects you in the event of a lawsuit. You should have at least enough to cover twice your assets. For all your insurance policies, take the highest deductible you can afford to pay out of pocket should you have a claim. Of course, if you have a claim, you'll have to pay more of the initial expense out of your own pocket, but you'll save significantly on premiums. Buy insurance to cover the potentially catastrophic losses, not the small stuff. If you know that you're an undisciplined saver, you may consider adopting the technique of designating certain savings or investment accounts towards specific goals. Perhaps because it's the farthest away, retirement is the most difficult long-term goal to bring into focus. Retirement is also much tougher to plan for than most goals because of all the difficult-to-make assumptions, inflation, life expectancy, social security benefits, taxes, rate of return, and so on, that go into the calculations. Goal-specific saving is challenging for most people given their many competing goals. Even a respectable 10 to 15% of your income may not be enough to accomplish such goals as saving for retirement, accumulating a down payment for a home, saving for children's college expenses, and tucking away some money for starting a small business. So you have to make some tough choices and prioritize your goals. Only you know what's important to you, which means that you're the most qualified person to make these decisions. But we want to stress the importance of contributing to retirement accounts, whether you use a 401k, SEP IRA, or IRA. Not only do retirement accounts shelter your investment earnings from taxation, but contributions to these accounts are also generally tax deductible. As for the money you're socking away, be sure to invest it wisely. Doing so isn't as difficult as most financial advisors and investment publications make it out to be. Some make it sound complicated in order to gain your confidence, business, and fees. Although it's true that money can't buy happiness, managing your personal finances efficiently can open up your future life options, such as switching into a lower paying but more fulfilling career, starting your own business, or perhaps working part-time at a home-based business when your kids are young so that you can be an involved parent. Work at achieving financial success and then be sure to make the most of it. Do all you can to reduce your expenses and lifestyle to a level that fits with the entrepreneurial life you want to lead. Now is the time to make your budget lean and entrepreneurially friendly. Determine what you spend each month on rent, mortgage, groceries, eating out, insurance, and so on. Your banking records, your credit card transactions, and your memory of cash purchases should help you piece together what you spend on various things in a typical month. The best way to track your expenses is to pay either by credit card, debit card, or check. Cash doesn't provide you a paper trail to reconcile your expenses at the end of the month. Beyond the bare essentials of food, shelter, health care, and clothing, most of what you spend money on is discretionary. In other words, luxuries. Even the dollars you spend on the so-called necessities, such as food and shelter, are usually only part necessity, with the balance being luxury. If you refuse to question your current spending, or if you view all your current spending as necessary, you'll probably have no option but to continue your career as an employee. You'll never be able to pursue your dream. Overspending won't make you happy. You'll be miserable over the years if your excess spending makes you feel chained to a job you don't like. Life is too short to work at a full-time job that doesn't make you happy. Shrinking your spending is a means to an end, that end being the ability to save for a rainy day. In the embryonic years of your business, you're going to see your fair share of rainy days. You may even experience years predominated by rain. Your wherewithal to stick with an entrepreneurial endeavor depends, in part, on your current war chest of cash. At a minimum, 
You should have three to six months of living expenses invested in an accessible account, such as a money market fund with low operating expenses. If you have consumer debt, after you finish paying off your debt, your top financial priority should be building this account. The bigger the war chest, the better. If you can accumulate a year's worth of living expenses, great. Poorly managed personal finances can destroy a business, no matter how successful and well-run it is. Also, we've noticed that poor personal financial management often leads to more of the same on a business level. Old habits aren't easy to change. However, keeping your personal finances on track, living within your means, planning how much you need to save for various goals, selecting sound investments, and maintaining catastrophic and cost-effective insurance coverage post-launch is vital to your financial future as well as to the viability of your business. As a small business owner, you need to be especially careful to stay on top of your required tax payments for both yourself and your employees. You also need to protect your personal finances from business-related lawsuits. Every successful company these days is in the business of providing solutions to customers' needs, desires, or problems. Thus, the question you should answer when creating your mission statement is, what solution do I provide? And what must I do to make sure that the solution I provide is consistently delivered? So how should your mission statement read? Here are a few examples to get you thinking. If you were going to open a restaurant, would your mission statement be to sell food or to provide delicious and sustainable food for those looking for solutions to enjoying healthy and appealing meals? If you were going to start a contracting business, would your mission statement read to build houses or to provide affordable building solutions for customers? If you were writing a how-to book for small business owners, would your mission statement be to write a 400-page business book or to provide readers with solutions to their business problems and suggestions for taking advantage of their business opportunities. Notice the common inference in all three of these mission statements to the keyword solutions. Give yourself plenty of room to grow within your niche when you develop your business's mission statement. Remember, mission statements aren't forever. Mission statements, like people and environments, can change. Lenders and professional investors read a business plan as much to find out about the preparer as to understand the business. They look for thoroughness, professionalism, and attention to detail in the plan, in addition to the presentation of a credible scenario for running a successful business. After all, thoroughness, professionalism, and attention to detail are the same traits they want to see in the person responsible for managing the money they invest in or lend to the business. What better early indication of these characteristics than the business plan? Remember, the sophisticated investor has learned from experience. Horses don't win races. Jockeys do. The jockey is you, the business owner, and the business plan is the first official indication of the kind of race your horse is going to run. Business plans take a lot of time and focus to prepare well, and are not to be confused with an afternoon jaunt to the beach. Similar to successfully locating the right financing and finding the right mentor, developing a successful business plan separates the potential doers from the dreamers. By and large, only the truly committed take the trouble to prepare a business plan. You find some exceptions, of course. Some potential small business owners have enough acumen and experience to carry a good business plan in their head. And, yes, some of those business owners have gone on to achieve great success. But you'd have a hard time convincing us that these same business owners couldn't have accomplished even greater success and avoided some early mistakes if they had taken the time to record and refine their ideas in a tangible business plan. The depth of your early commitment to writing a business plan directly correlates to your chance for success. And a well-thought-out business plan demonstrates the depth of commitment necessary for you to end up at the helm of a successful small business. Business Description The purpose of this part is to provide the reader with an overview of the business. After reviewing this part, the reader should understand exactly what business you're in, 
what its legal entity is, and how your business intends to differentiate itself from its competitors. Don't take this challenge lightly. The reader's decision to peruse the plan in more depth will depend on his initial reaction to this description. A. Mission Statement Write your mission statement as we describe earlier in the section B. Summary of the Business This section answers the basic question, What business am I in? Begin this summary with a one-sentence definition of exactly what your business will do or does. This sentence should be the same to-the-point definition you'll ultimately use as your one-minute pitch when explaining your business to everyone from bankers to customers to cocktail party acquaintances. If you can't define your business in one sentence, something is probably wrong with your vision and the focus of what your business should be. The concept of your business doesn't have to be unique or extraordinary. Electricians, tax preparers, and computer consultants will always be in demand. More businesses succeed by being managed efficiently and wisely than by providing a new and unique product or service. If you want your business to really be different, you can put a new twist on a concept that has been around for a while. C. Legal Description Is your business a sole proprietorship, partnership, C corporation, S corporation, or limited liability corporation? D. Competitive Edge Answer the following questions to clearly communicate how you intend to differentiate your company from your competitors. Who are your competitors, and what, in your opinion, is currently their competitive edge? Here you want to identify your competitors' strengths so that you can, in the early stages of your business anyway, avoid competing directly against them. What are your competitors' weaknesses? By identifying their weaknesses, you open the opportunity to hit them where they're the most vulnerable. What will distinguish your products or services from those of your competitors? This distinction doesn't have to be something new and unique. Simply doing something better often suffices. Service, quality, or price. Which of the three do you intend to emphasize? Remember, you can't be all things to all people. Where do you intend to position your product in the marketplace? Do you intend to be the top service and quality provider within your niche? Or do you plan to concentrate on the low end of the niche by focusing mainly on price? You can generally find a number of positions in every marketplace, so there should be plenty of room for you if you do what you do better than your competitors. Remember, it's extremely difficult, if not impossible, for most small businesses to be the low-cost player in a niche. In most cases, Small businesses should focus on service and quality and leave the low pricing to someone else. Management The management section is the most important part of your business plan if you intend to use your plan as a vehicle to raise money. Intelligent investors recognize that the success or failure of a business hinges on the quality of the management team. Hence, the management section is one of the first places investors look when they pick up your plan. If they aren't impressed with the management team, you can rest assured that they won't go any further. Begin your management section with biographies of the principal members of your business, the president, vice president, sales and marketing managers, board members, and so on. Be accurate in outlining their backgrounds and remember that the prudent investor checks references. In each descriptive biography, include the following information education, prior positions, noteworthy achievements. Remember, as you draft the management section, remember that you're selling your management team to the reader. Include what makes them special. Pay the most attention to the bio pertaining to the person who makes the most difference to the business, you. If you use the business plan only as a roadmap and not as an inducement for investment, the management summary is less important. However, composing the qualifications and employment histories of the major players on paper may help you better think through whether the players fit well together and will make a synergetic and complementary team. Marketing Plan The marketing part of your business plan provides an overview of the industry in which your business competes, a description of your business's potential customers, 
and an explanation of how you intend to sell, distribute, and promote your product or service. This part of the plan is often the most difficult and the most important for companies to complete. Many competing products and services will fall within your niche. The difficulty, of course, is in differentiating and highlighting your products and services to prospective customers and then convincing them to buy them. The marketing part of your plan will make or break your success in this aspect of the business. Listen on to find out how to write it. A. The industry at large. In this section, you provide an overview of the industry within the geographical area you expect your business to cover by answering the following questions. How competitive is the industry? What are the growth opportunities? Who are the industry leaders? Where are the niches in addition to yours? You can usually obtain answers to these questions by reviewing websites, talking to customers, and speaking with people at your industry's trade associations. You can also consult those who are already in specified niches within the industry, such as wholesalers or manufacturers' reps. B. Potential customers. If your business sells to consumers rather than to other businesses, consider gender, age, income, geographic location, marital status, number of children, education, housing situation, rent or own, and the reasons why they may want your product or service. Which of these demographics represent your desired customers? Create a profile of how your target market behaves as customers. Consider what motivates them to buy and how they buy, including whether they rely on recommendations from others, what their product usage rate tendencies are, when they make their purchases, whether they buy online, on credit, or on impulse. This target customer profile information will come in handy when you're ready to select the right media advertising vehicle to use. If you sell to businesses, B2B, you need to understand similar demographic issues that relate to them. What types of businesses will buy your products and services? Who within those businesses will be the ultimate decision makers, and how can you reach them? What problems of the ultimate decision makers will you solve with your products or services? C. The benefits of your product or service. Remember, too many businesses know exactly how to describe the features of their products or services but don't know how to point out the benefits. Today's consumers, particularly the more sophisticated ones, are more interested in hearing about the benefits of your gizmo than in hearing about its features. You're manufacturing a new computer? Don't tell me about its dimensions and its horsepower. Tell me about what it will do for me that the others won't. You're selling a promotional product? Don't tell me about where it's manufactured or how much it weighs. Tell me about how it can benefit the growth of my business. D. Geography. Identify your primary geographic focus. That is, where do you expect your customers to come from? Will your customer focus be within local markets, statewide, nationwide, international? Clearly, your advertising and other promotions will be quite different if you're marketing overseas rather than simply in your hometown. E. Distribution. Explain how you intend to get your products or services to the marketplace. Describe your role in the industry and your distribution plan. Are you a manufacturer, service provider, wholesaler, retailer? Will you utilize a direct sales force, an e-commerce website, manufacturer's reps, catalogs, telemarketing, direct mail? F. Advertising. Identify how you can best reach your potential customers. Will you do so online or via newspaper, radio, television, magazines, direct mail, or phone? Which advertising methods are the most economically feasible within your budget? Which ones do your desired customers most heavily utilize? What internal programs or external agencies can you use? Include your social media plan in this section. Do you intend to maintain a Facebook presence? What about Twitter, LinkedIn, Groupon? G. Public Relations 
Public relations is the art of keeping your name in the public in a positive way other than through paid advertising. Public relations involves such activities as employee, community, industry, and government relations, customer and prospective customer relations, and the best known aspect of public relations, publicity. Publicity resources are usually free. The trick is to get the attention of the writer or reporter who can do you the most good when your competitors, and indeed just about everyone else in the business world, are trying to do the same thing. A good public relations plan can help you build a positive image in the minds of those in your target audience and guide your efforts as you seek to generate publicity that can expand awareness of your product or service. This section of your business plan should answer the following questions. What public relations techniques will you use? What is your business's publicity hook? And why will it interest editors, reporters, and those in your target audience? How will you build relationships with those in your target market as well as with select editorial contacts? How can you tap into your network of friends and business associates to build a positive image of your business and to gain editorial introductions? Consider participating in career day at a local school, sponsoring a runner in a charity marathon, or designating a portion of a road or highway to be maintained by your business. And don't forget the simple press release, alerting the media and community to worthwhile achievements of your company and its people. H. Pricing. Explain your short-term and long-term pricing. Include information on costs and profit expectations, along with a thorough review of your competitor's pricing and your perceived price point position within the industry. Do you intend to be the low-cost provider or the high-end producer? How do you intend to position your product? When pricing your products, always consider the current competitive climate first. Research the pricing of similar services or products in the marketplace, and then price your product accordingly. Don't make the mistake early on of pricing your products simply or solely based on some predetermined profit margin that you or your accountant would like to achieve. Instead, Price your products based on what your competitive research, primarily talking to customers, determines the market will bear. Don't be afraid to sell your services or products at healthy margins when the opportunity presents itself. Rest assured, the opportunity won't last forever. I. Sales terms and credit policies. A sale is never complete until you deposit the proceeds safely in your business account. With this in mind, you need to spell out the terms of the sale and the conditions governing the granting of credit and the acceptance of payment before you make your first sale. Financial Management Plan Your good idea is likely to turn into your worst nightmare if you ignore or are unrealistic about the financial aspect of your business. If you're one of those creative types or a mover and shaker who hates to work with numbers, you may decide to blow off the financial part of the business plan. Doing so, we're sorry to tell you, can cost you at a minimum the dollars you need to grow your business and at maximum the very existence of the business itself. Along with marketing, financial management is the most often neglected part of every small business venture. Don't let it be yours. Remember, before you do any of your financial projections, consider the following. Ask your tax advisor, if you're working with one, to show you examples of similar financial projections from other business plans to use as a guideline. Don't bother projecting more than three years out. The assumptions you make will be too vague. Exception. Some outside investors may require five-year projections. Thoroughly identify the assumptions you make. The garbage-in, garbage-out theory is alive and well when it comes to projecting financial results. The conclusions you reach will be no better than the quality of your assumptions. Prominently itemize these assumptions in your business plan to allow the reader to know exactly what they are and how they were made. In the likely event that you don't know how to produce the pro forma profit and loss statement, balance sheet, and cash flow projections, you can hire a tax advisor, hire a business plan consultant, purchase a business plan software package, 
learn to use spreadsheet software and do the projections yourself. We recommend that you use a program such as Microsoft Excel for your projections. Spreadsheets and financial statements are tools that every successful small business owner needs to understand. You can find out how to use them now or later, but sooner is better. A. Pro Forma Profit and Loss Statement A pro forma profit and loss statement is a projected income and expense plan that summarizes your estimated revenue and expenses over a specified period of time. The accuracy of your pro forma profit and loss statement depends on the quality of the assumptions you make. If you make good assumptions going in, then you can expect meaningful results. Preparing a pro forma profit and loss statement forces you to think through the questions you need to answer to arrive at the assumptions you make. Estimating your expenses for your pro forma profit and loss statement is relatively easy. The most difficult assumptions you have to make are your sales and other income, revenues, and your gross margin, gross profit. Many small business owners generate two or even three separate pro formas. For example, a best case scenario, a middle case scenario, and a worst case scenario. Prepare your profit and loss projections for the first three years of your business, unless you're seeking venture capital funding, in which case the first five years may be required. Anything longer requires too many far-out, hard-to-make assumptions. Compute the first year's pro forma on a monthly basis and the second and third years on a quarterly basis. B. Balance Sheet A balance sheet measures your business's resources, assets, and obligations, liabilities, at a particular time. The balance sheet is important to understand and, incidentally, is just as relevant to your personal financial situation as it is to your business one. As a matter of fact, if you apply for a loan at a financial institution, you'll almost certainly have to submit a personal balance sheet. If you aren't currently keeping one to track your family's assets, you should be. Although we recommend that every business include a balance sheet in its business plan, it's especially relevant for those businesses that have significant non-cash assets tied up in such categories as inventory and accounts receivable. Remember, as with the profit and loss statement, prepare a projected balance sheet for the first three years of business. Project the first year on a monthly basis and the second and third years on a quarterly basis. C. Cash Flow Projections Cash flow is the amount of cash that moves through your business in the form of receipts representing an increase in cash and expenses and capital expenditures representing a decrease in cash. Cash flow is the practical side of the accounting equation, representing the cash required to keep your business operating on a day-to-day -day basis. Remember, don't confuse cash flow with profitability, an accounting term that measures the results of the entire operation of the business, of which cash is only one important part over a given period of time. While profitability provides the benchmarks for measuring the effectiveness of your operations, Cash flow is what pays the bills. As a prospective business owner, you need to project your business's cash needs before going into business so that you know how much money you need to raise. As with profit and loss and balance sheet projections, project your cash flow needs for the first three years of the business. Operations. This part outlines the nuts and bolts of the operational issues involved in managing your company. The scope of your operations or management plan covers a wide range of functions, from dealing with employees to purchasing from vendors to maintaining your company's accounting records. A. Employees Many small businesses are one-person operations. If you fall into this category, you don't have to suffer any of the headaches of hiring, motivating, training, and firing employees. The only person you have to worry about is you, which, if you're anything like your humble authors, should be no small project in itself. However, if you do plan to have employees, you need to answer the following questions in this section of the business plan. How will you assemble your team? By leasing your employees or by hiring them outright? Where will you find the employees you intend to hire yourself? What benefits will you offer? 
What motivational incentives will you use? Will you assemble an employee manual? Will you offer a retirement plan? Will there be down the road opportunities for ownership for key employees? How will you train your employees? B. Compensation. Too many small businesses begin hiring employees without first devising an overall compensation plan. Such an oversight inevitably leads to a lack of uniformity in compensation. When employees perceive that you're not compensating them fairly relative to other employees and that you haven't communicated an objective reason for this discrepancy, a line may begin to form outside your office. For purposes of the business plan, you need to objectively define the basics of your compensation plan for hourly, salaried, and commissioned employees. Don't forget to include bonus plans and perks. C. Vendors and outside resources. What vendors and outside resources do you intend to use? How do you plan to kick off your relationship with key vendors? Vendor accessibility is an important issue in many industries. Frequently, the best vendors don't make their line of products available to every customer, especially the new kid on the block with no history, no prior connections in the industry, and an anemic balance sheet. You need to have answers to their qualifying questions before you make your first call. D. Accounting and or bookkeeping. Describe who will take care of your accounting and bookkeeping duties. Answer these questions. Will you hire an experienced bookkeeper, CPA, controller, or chief financial officer? Do you intend to computerize your accounting system? What accounting software package will you use? Do you plan to outsource your bookkeeping or accounting? What outside resource will you use? This section is particularly important for those businesses that intend to use the business plan as a tool to invite a loan or an investment. The smart lender or investor wants to be sure that the financial responsibilities of running the business are in good hands. This is especially true when the entrepreneur isn't particularly strong on the financial side of business. Risks. You, as well as potential lenders and investors in your business, should care about the potential risks in your business. The better you understand them, the better able you'll be to anticipate them, minimize them, and keep your business in business. Risks are inherent in every business, and yours will be no exception. Identify those risks in your business plan and be candid and thorough in describing them. Investors and lenders know that every business faces risks, so they'll be looking for honesty and awareness here, not ambivalence or avoidance. They know how to recognize the difference. Sole ownership is always the least conflictive and most popular of the three options for starting a company. Assuming that you have access to the necessary funds to launch your business, industry knowledge, and energy to make a go of the business by yourself. Sure, the leverage and financial benefits that partners and shareholders bring to the table can be worthwhile, but decision-making in shared ownership situations requires consensus, and consensus can take a lot of time. Besides, Consensus doesn't always represent your personal best interests, and when your name is on your loan's personal guarantees dotted line, your personal best interests should be at or near the top of the reasons for making decisions. Being the only owner has the following advantages. It's generally easier, quicker, and less expensive. You don't need any lawyers to write up a partnership agreement or assist in determining answers to all the questions that a partnership agreement requires. The profits belong solely to you. You don't have to share the fruits of your hard work. You have no need for consensus. Your way is the only way. You don't waste time catering to the often aggravating demands of shareholders, minority or otherwise. There's no possibility of shareholder lawsuits. On the other hand, being the only owner has the following disadvantages. You have no one to share the risk with. This is the downside of the profits belong solely to you advantage that we describe in the preceding list. Your limited skills have to carry your business until you can hire someone with complementary skills. The small business owner has to wear many hats. Unfortunately, 
Many of those hats simply don't fit. The day you can begin hiring employees who are capable in areas where you're not will be one of the highlights of your small business career. Single ownership can be lonely. Many times, you'll wish you had someone with whom to share the problems and stress. If you're lucky, you may be able to do this with trusted senior employees. Of course, if you have good friends and or a strong marriage partner, these people can also be a source of much-needed support. Partners make sense when they can bring needed capital, along with complementary management skills, to the business. Unfortunately, partners also present the opportunity for turmoil, and especially in the early stages of a business's growth, turmoil takes time, burns energy, and costs money, all of which most small business founders lack. If you're one of those rare individuals who is fortunate enough to have found the right partner, go for it. Work out a deal. We've seen this proven many times over. A partnership in the right hands can outperform a sole proprietorship in the right hands. Having minority shareholders, any and all shareholders who collectively own less than 50%, can also make sense, especially after the business is out of the blocks and has accumulated value. The most common methods of putting stock in the hands of employees include stock option plans, bonuses, and employee stock ownership plans, ESOPs. Remember, because of the potentially tenuous relationship that can exist between majority and minority shareholders, you should always, we repeat, always involve an attorney when inviting minority shareholders to the party, and you should always include a buy-sell agreement in the deal. If the relationship doesn't turn out to be what all parties expected, buy-sell agreements establish procedures for issuing, valuing, and selling shares of the company, including how to determine the value of shares when one or more of the owners want to cash out. Occasionally, especially where venture capital financing is involved, the founder of the business may find herself working for majority shareholders. Fortunately, this situation rarely occurs because the typical small business founder has already proven that taking orders from others is not exactly one of her inherent strengths. We've found that, on the infrequent occasions when this situation does occur, often the founder of the company is the first one to get the boot when the going gets tough, as the chief financiers step in to protect their investment. That's why we strongly recommend that you find a way to retain majority control. Whether you decide to hire tax advisors or deal with taxes completely on your own, your best strategy for reducing your small business taxes and complying with tax laws is to educate yourself. If you can afford to hire outside bookkeeping and tax preparers or advisors, and you'd prefer to do so, go ahead. But take note, we believe it's a mistake to seek such assistance without first investing a small amount of time to better understand what the tax laws are and how they fit into your small business and personal financial situations. Just by understanding the tax system, you can legally reduce your tax bills by tens of thousands of dollars during your working years. Compound these savings over the life of your business, and you'll see why we're so adamant about figuring out how to play the tax-saving game. In this section, we cover resources that can help you deal with taxes on your own, and we offer tips for how to hire tax preparers and advisors. Consider the following tax benefits when you find yourself wondering whether keeping good records and staying on top of your business bookkeeping are worth your time and effort. Reduced taxes. The better the financial records you keep for your business, the better able you are to come up with legal, tax-reducing deductions when the time comes to fill out that dreaded annual tax return. Also, good records enable you to stay on top of your income tax payments for yourself and your business and payroll tax payments for your employees throughout the year, saving you late interest and penalty charges. Easier and less costly income tax return preparation. If you don't keep a proper accounting of your income and expenses during the tax year, you won't be able to accurately complete the necessary tax forms when the time comes to file them for your business. A tax preparer may actually be happy with your slipshod practices, however. The more time she has to spend assembling and organizing your documentation, the fatter the tax preparation fee you'll have to pay. 
documentation for audits. Because the IRS uncovers more mistakes and fraud on small business returns than on ordinary employee returns, small business owners get audited at a much higher rate than employees who draw a paycheck. The better records you keep, the better able you'll be to effectively substantiate your tax return in the event that you do get audited. Better planning for subsequent years. The better your records from last year, the better the decisions you'll make when planning for the coming year. Knowing and managing your tax bracket. Over the years that you own and operate your small business, your income will, we hope, increase. Most likely, it will also fluctuate from year to year. Because of the way the IRS and most states tax income, your changing income will probably place you in different tax brackets from year to year. Tip. The good news is that you may be able to legally shift some of your business's income and expenses from one tax year to another, saving yourself some tax dollars, perhaps even thousands of dollars, in the process. For example, if you operate your business on a cash basis, meaning that you recognize or report income in the tax year in which that income was received and expenses in the tax year that you paid them, you can exert some control over the amount of profit that your business reports in a given tax year. Sole proprietorships, partnerships, S-corporations, limited liability corporations, LLCs, and personal service corporations, for instance, can typically shift revenue and expenses. On the other hand, C-corporations and partnerships that have C-corporations as partners may not use the cash accounting method. Suppose that, like most business owners, you expect your next year's income to be higher than this year's and you expect to be in a higher tax bracket next year. In this case, you can likely reduce your total tax bill for both this year and next by paying more of your expenses in the following year, thus reducing your next year's taxable income, which you expect to be taxed at a higher rate. Although you can't expect your employees to wait until January for their November paychecks, maybe you can delay buying a new photocopying or fax machine or paying a December invoice for expenses as long as no penalties are involved, until the beginning of the next tax year. For most entrepreneurs, product and service development is the most enjoyable part of building a business. Whether refining an existing product or service, or inventing a brand spanking new one, many entrepreneurs hang out their shingles in the first place because they believe they have valuable products or services to offer, or have identified an unmet demand in the marketplace. They love the nuances of their products or services and are forever looking for ways to redefine and expand them. Even though most small businesses go about product and service development in haphazard ways, a defined process exists. That process goes something like this. 1. Get an idea. Someone, not necessarily you, the entrepreneur, hatches the idea. No matter where it comes from, though, you the business owner, are always the one to champion or support the idea. Tip. New product and service ideas can come from a variety of sources, including vendors, trade publications, and, of course, employees. Unquestionably, however, many new product ideas result from talking and listening to customers, both current and potential. After all, customers are the people who are most familiar with the use of the product or service. And customers are, in most cases, the same people who ultimately purchase new products. 2. Evaluate the idea. Work with people responsible for product development to complete this step. If that person is you, work with prospective customers to help define your product or service. Pay particular attention to issues such as profit potential, ease of manufacturing, where applicable, competition, and pricing. 3. Analyze your opportunity. Present the product or service concept to a few select customers to determine the size and scope of the potential market. 4. Develop your product or service. At this stage, if the project is still a go, your goal is to develop the product or service. Time to dot the I's and cross the T's in preparation for the next step. 5. Test the market. Conduct market research. Test the completed product or service with a few prospective customers with the intent of working out any bugs, 
in preparation for the product's official introduction to the marketplace. 6. Introduce your product or service to the marketplace. Begin an advertising program, send the press releases, and start training the salespeople or manufacturer's representatives who will be responsible for selling the new product or service. Remember, because not every idea will turn into a workable or profitable product or service, you need to be tough as you proceed through these steps, especially when you reach the evaluation process. Make sure that you thoroughly evaluate the pros and cons before moving on to the opportunity analysis stage. The product development process is expensive, and you're better off cutting your losses early in the process rather than later. Pricing. Someone once observed that pricing is two-thirds marketing and one-third financial. This statement goes against the grain of common sense, which suggests that nothing can be more financial than price. But if your pricing isn't right, your marketing plan, no matter how well crafted, won't get off the ground. Price is too high, your product won't sell. Price is too low, your product may sell, but your company won't be profitable. The price, as the television game show proclaims, must be right. To properly understand the role of pricing, you must first understand margin. Margin is the difference between how much it costs you to produce your product or service and how much you can sell it for. If your widget costs your company $2 to manufacture, for instance, and you sell it for $3, your margin is $1. Presented in terms of percentages, if you make a profit of $1 on each $3 sale, your margin is 33%, $1 divided by $3. Developing your pricing strategy. Every business needs an overall strategy to guide it in making its pricing decisions. This means you need to plan your pricing strategy instead of just letting it evolve. Pricing shouldn't be a decision you make on a day-to-day -day basis, but rather an extension of an overall plan. For example, you may decide, by planning, to be the lowest-priced company in your niche, thus attracting customers who think they're getting a bargain by frequenting your business. Or you may want to have the highest prices in your niche. High prices send messages of quality and distinction to some customers. Witness art galleries, fine wines, or Brooks Brothers shirts. You may even want to sell some of your products at cost or even at a lower-than-cost price. These products are referred to as loss leaders to attract customers who will then buy other products at higher prices. As a small business owner, you have the flexibility to determine your price points any way you see fit. Keep the following five factors in mind as you consider your pricing strategy. Your marketing objectives. Marketing objectives vary with the product or service you're selling. If, for example, you have a new product to introduce, your short-term objective may be to gain market share and preempt competition making your product well-known to the consumer in the process. So, you may discount your normal prices over the short term, with profitability being shunted to the background to achieve your long-term objectives. Another marketing objective may be to sell slow-moving inventory to generate cash. Similar to the example of new product introduction, this objective also dictates short-term discounted pricing. Remember. Be careful, however, not to get in the habit of continually discounting prices, unless, that is, you want to be perceived as a discounter. Most of the time, your marketing objective should be to maximize profit on your products without losing too many sales in the process. This objective should dictate your long-term pricing decisions. The cost to produce the product or service. Cost is the total of all the expenses involved in generating your product or service. Not only direct costs, such as wages and salaries directly involved in the product, materials, and freight in, but also indirect costs, such as administration, accounting, and sales. Knowing the direct and indirect costs of your product or service is important in determining its break-even point, also called break-even cost, or the price below which you can't sell your offering without losing money. Remember, 
Cost is one barometer of your break-even point, but it should never be the primary determinant in the pricing process. The process of determining your break-even cost is quite simple, assuming, that is, that your accounting system captures the necessary figures. Here's how to determine your break-even cost. 1. Determine the direct cost allocation for each product or service. Add all the direct costs, those directly involved in its manufacture, wages specifically involved in the product or service, materials, and incoming freight, associated with that particular product or service during a specific accounting period, preferably one month, but no more than one quarter. Divide the total amount of direct cost dollars by the total number of products manufactured or services provided during that period. 2. Determine the indirect cost allocation for each product or service. Add the total dollars of your indirect costs, those indirect general and administrative costs that can't be specifically tied to a product or service, for the specific accounting period. Divide that number by the total number of products or services you provided in that period. 3. Add the direct cost allocation to the indirect cost allocation to reveal your break-even cost. Amounts above the break-even cost represent your profit on that product or service. Amounts below it represent your loss. If you offer more than one product or service, the process of determining a break-even point for each product or service can become complicated. Whether you succeed in arriving at an accurate break-even cost for each product or service depends on the sophistication of your accounting system. Customer Demand The relative ease or difficulty of selling your product or service to the customer should play an important part in the pricing decision. What's the ratio of product on the market to supply available? The price points in all industries are subject to fluctuating supply and demand factors. Supply and demand is basically a scarcity of goods services equation. For instance, the more computer repair people you have in your area, the less the demand for each of their individual services. Comparative value to the customer. Just as beauty is in the eyes of the beholder, the value of a product is in the eyes of the customer. In addition to knowing what your product is worth in your eyes, you need to understand how much your product is perceived to be worth in the eyes of your customers. Set your prices at a level where your desired customers feel that they're getting their money's worth. Competition. Who is your competition? And what's the price point of their products? How comparable are those products to yours? What are their products' perceived values compared to yours? And what factors affect their perceived values? To determine the answers to these questions, you must first kick your competitors' tires by visiting the stores or websites where their products are sold or by picking up the phone and asking the right questions. Ask buyers of their products questions like the following. Why did you purchase the product? What is your perception of the relationship between value and price? Would you pay more for it if you had to? What do you like most about the product, and what do you like least about it? Tip. When comparing your product to that of your competitors, be sure to include all the criteria involved, not just the price. Additional criteria can include delivery, strength of brand name, image, packaging, quality, after-sales service, guarantees, return and trade-in policies, and more. Distribution is how you get your product or service to the ultimate consumer. Distribution channels vary within the same industry and apply to all businesses. No one right or wrong way exists to distribute your products or services. You can, however, usually find a way that works best for you. Two basic categories of distribution exist, depending on whether a middleman comes between the manufacturer of the products or the provider of the services and the consumer. Direct distribution occurs when no middleman is involved. Indirect distribution involves a middleman. Each distribution channel has evolved for a reason, and each one has its own strengths and weaknesses. 
The direct distribution of products involves establishing one-on-one -on -one relationships with the buyers without involving any middlemen along the way. Retail. National retail chains like Gap and The Body Shop have chosen to sell their products through a direct distribution channel. What better way to avoid a middleman and be close to your customers than to physically interact with them in a retail environment? Knowing your customer is crucial to any small business's success, and a retail distribution system offers a perfect vehicle for doing just that. Another advantage of retail distribution is that you retain the entire markup on your products. Still another advantage is that, in most cases, you don't have the expense of maintaining accounts receivable, as in, put it on my tab, because these days retailing is primarily a cash or credit debit card business. Although credit card charges, Visa, MasterCard, American Express, and others, may not represent immediate cash, they do represent a dependable stream of cash, and you don't have to worry about collecting the funds. You do, of course, have to pay fees, up to 2% or more, for these privileges. The disadvantage of retail distribution is that the costs of maintaining and staffing a retail store are high. Also, because you can't have your eye on the till and the door all the time, in most cases, retail is susceptible to theft of both cash and inventory. Finally, in most cases, you're required to sign a lease, a document that legally binds you to pay a landlord, typically for several years or more, regardless of whether your store remains profitable or even in business. Direct Mail Direct mail refers to the mailing of flyers and advertisements directly to a specific audience. The success or failure of any direct mail campaign is usually tied to the quality of both the mailing list and the promotional piece itself. One of direct mail's advantages is its capability to directly target and reach qualified prospects, people who fit your demographic projections of who's most likely to want your product or service. Looking for a list of potential customers with two or more children who own their own homes and who have annual incomes over $100,000? No problem. You can purchase a list and do the mailing yourself, or you can hire a firm that will do it all for you. One disadvantage of direct mail is the relatively high cost per contact. The cost per thousand of direct mailings is significantly higher than the cost per thousand to reach newspaper or magazine readers via advertising. The difference, of course, is that if your mailing list is good, every recipient represents a qualified prospect, whereas only a fraction of your advertising contacts may be qualified. A second disadvantage of direct mail is that some consumers simply don't like the direct mail medium, so you can end up alienating potential customers when you use it. Here's how to successfully develop your own direct mail program. Collect existing direct mail pieces that you like and use them as examples for your own design. Contact the business behind the materials that appeal to you the most and inquire who created the pieces and how they did so. Concentrate on solving your customers' problems, not on selling them products. Decide what offer you'll make to move your target prospect to take the action your mailer invites. For example, people don't want to count steps and calories. They want to increase their energy and improve their health. So if your fitness programs can help them do that, therein lies your message. Remember, this tactic is commonly known as selling your product's benefits, not its features, and it's quite possibly the number one rule of marketing. Purchase or rent a mailing list by interviewing several different list companies. Look in the traditional yellow pages or online under mailing lists or call trade magazine reps and inquire about their subscription lists. Costs should vary from $25 to $75 per thousand names. Make sure you've defined the target market for your product or service and obtained a mailing list that includes only those who match the profile of your target. Consider using a self-mailer when possible, thereby saving you the cost of an envelope. 
More people throw away junk mail in sealed envelopes anyway. Stick with it. Don't give up after the first mailing. Many consumers need to see the same message several times before they react. Follow up your mailings with phone calls. When you intend to follow up the mailing with a phone call, which often helps to ensure better results, stagger your mailings so that you don't have to make too many calls during a short time period. Maintain a complete record of the results of your mailing, detailing the number of responses and the number of orders that result. A 2 to 3% response rate on a first time direct mailing is usually considered good. Mail order catalogs. Mail order catalogs, along with websites, have enjoyed a leap in popularity as the American shopper does more and more of her shopping from the comfort of home. Make no mistake about it, however, catalog selling is an expensive channel for businesses, especially for startups. Creating and mailing a top notch catalog can be off the charts expensive, depending on the size of the mailings. If you can't afford a top notch catalog, you probably don't belong in this distribution channel. Initial outlays include the charge for obtaining mailing lists, the costs of creating and developing the catalog, and the mailing expenses. And don't forget the additional cost and risk of maintaining sufficient inventory to be able to ship your orders within a reasonable amount of time. Internet sales. Certainly the newer kid on the block, internet selling, also known as e commerce, is the most exciting development since the wagon trains headed west. Internet sales are another form of catalog sales. Customers simply connect to your company's website, click around until they find the items they're looking for, plug in their credit card numbers, and wait for the packages to arrive by mail. Distribution via the internet is easy on the shopper. No dodging traffic or fighting crowds, and easy on the vendor. No mall rent or expensive mailing lists. Incidentally, this relatively inexpensive way of reaching customers also allows internet prices for most products, except for those that are quite costly to ship, to be competitive. Of course, you will have the costs of developing and maintaining a website, which can add up, especially if you're not careful. Internet selling works best for the small business when you have an off the beaten path product that customers can't find anywhere else. Customers who are having trouble finding good products easily turn to internet searches to locate alternative suppliers. Trade shows. You may be in an industry that allows you to use trade shows to purchase your products from your vendors or to sell your products to your customers. Trade shows also provide the opportunity to network with other people who do the same thing you do and to check out the competition. Most of all, the information you glean from successfully working a trade show allows you to keep a firm pulse on your industry. Don't overlook the training classes that are usually included with most trade shows. Yes, trade shows can be expensive by the time you factor in travel and time away from the job. But they're usually a justifiable marketing expense. Indirect distribution is the process by which consumer products or services pass through a middleman before reaching the consumer, reaching your customers through other retailers. Traverse the aisles of a Walmart or Target store, and you'll find that every product on its shelves is from a manufacturer somewhere who has opted for the secondhand retailing method of indirect distribution. Meanwhile, Walmart and Target are left to do what they do best sell retail to the consumer. The advantage of selling to retailers is that you have to deal with only one or a few customers, the retailer's buyers, which simplifies the distribution process immensely. This one stop selling process enhances the relationship building process, that is, the establishment of a relationship between the vendor and the customer. In this case, the relationship is typically between the manufacturer's salesperson and the retailer's buyer. Warning One distinct disadvantage of selling your products to retailers, especially those with multiple stores, is that they often use the size of the orders they place as leverage to become extremely demanding on such issues as price, payment, 
delivery, and packaging. Retailers, especially the larger ones, can keep their prices low for a reason, and often that reason comes at the expense of their vendors, especially the smaller ones that don't have the leverage the bigger guys have. Relying on wholesalers or distributors. Wholesale distribution is a perfect example of how the middleman process works. The typical wholesaler, distributor, buys large quantities of products from manufacturers, breaks them down into manageable quantities, sometimes repackages them, and then offers them to the consumer. Examples of wholesalers include plumbing and electrical supply businesses, whose primary customers are contractors, and grocery wholesalers, whose primary customers are grocery and convenience stores. Many manufacturers like working with wholesalers because they don't want the hassles associated with selling to consumers and smaller customers. After all, their expertise is in manufacturing. Repackaging Another common example of indirect distribution is repackaging, selling your products to another manufacturer or developer of related products who offers them to its customers in another form. You often see examples of repackaging in the grocery business, where a grocery store chain sells products that bear the store's own name, the process is known as private labeling, on the containers of products someone else has manufactured. Many juices, frozen foods, and health and beauty products have been repackaged. An advantage of repackaging is that, in most cases, the sales and marketing functions are left to your customer, allowing you to concentrate on the manufacturing part of your business. The disadvantages are that your profit margins are sure to suffer, and you're likely to be overly dependent on one customer, the company doing the repackaging. Promotion is the process of informing potential customers about your company and its products and services, and then influencing them to purchase what you're selling. Promotional activities include word-of-mouth advertising, networking, media advertising, online marketing, and publicity. You'll direct some of your promotional activities to generate immediate sales. You'll use others to build the brand, in turn educating, informing, and planting the seeds for future sales. Tip. Before you invest in any promotional effort, you must first determine the target market you want to reach and the objective you want to achieve. If you want prospective customers to call or visit your website, your ad must give good reasons to do so, and it needs to have a prominent presentation of your phone number and website address. If you want to create foot traffic, you have to offer time-sensitive, compelling reasons to visit your business, such as a one-time discount or the appearance of a VIP. To put everything you need to know about promotion in one sentence, it's knowing your audience and your objective and then crafting your messages accordingly. Online marketing. It's difficult to remember those days when marketing your small business online wasn't one of the most important strategies in your overall marketing arsenal. But if it currently isn't, it probably should be. Although the process of marketing online can often seem elusive, confusing, and ever-changing, there are basic opportunities and strategies that can help you harness the power of online marketing and put it to work for your business. Social media. Why should you use social media to reach your customers? Because it's where most of them live. Ask nearly anyone you know, no matter their age or lifestyle, and chances are they use some type of social media, such as Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, Pinterest, Twitter, and so on, to stay connected to friends, family, and co-workers, as well as the brands, companies, and causes that they love. Used wisely, the best social media can target your specific clientele. An added benefit is that if you're strategic about using the various forms of social media, it doesn't have to be expensive. Choose the social media that aligns with your business. Several social platforms are available, but not all are likely to be the best fit for your business. Evaluate the advantages of Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Pinterest, 
making sure your bandwidth is sufficient to effectively pursue your choice. Start with one of the platforms, then move into additional options as you get a grasp on which strategies work best for your business and are used most frequently by the people you're trying to reach. Know your audience. If you want to know how to best reach your potential or current customers, you must first understand who they are and where they spend their online time. The easiest way to do this is to sample your existing clientele through focus groups, surveys, and or one-on-one -on -one conversations. When doing so, look for information like occupation, income, buying patterns, and lifestyle. Once you get a grasp on the behavior and habits of the people you're trying to connect with, you'll better understand how to reach them. Make your social media visual. Learn how to use photography, images, or videos in your postings. Be sure to use visuals that are professional, relevant to your business, and as unique and creative as possible. A picture or video, as they say, is worth a thousand words. Engage with your customers. Once you've decided on the social media channel that's best suited to your customers, designate someone in your business who understands the medium. If that person doesn't exist, contract with an independent professional. And remember, timely, dependable, and relevant communications allow your customers to know that there's a human element to your business and that you care about them. Social media is your chance to let your business's personality shine through. Email marketing. Although email marketing has been an effective and relatively inexpensive marketing tool for small businesses in the past, it is a strategy that today needs more focus and consideration. Nearly all small businesses communicate with or market to their customers via email. And that's the problem. Most of our inboxes are flooded with messages, offers, and promotions, not only on our computers, but also on our phones and other devices. Paying more attention to building a successful email list and considering how your potential customers prefer to digest their information can make the difference in email's effectiveness. Get permission. The best use of email marketing is to reach out to your existing customer base. For example, people who are already familiar with your business. In most cases, those people have already expressed an interest in what you do, which means they will likely be predisposed to open your emails. When attempting to attract new prospects, you need to have a clear purpose in mind when asking for permission. Anyone who gives up their email information to you will want to understand why he should. You need to answer the following questions in advance of beginning your email campaign. What's in it for the customer if he gives you his address? Will he get a discount on price or valuable information? How often will you be emailing him? What response will you be expecting? A sale, a connection, or simply getting your name out there? Will you give, sell his email address or other personal information to anyone else? Avoid being identified as spam. The best way to avoid landing in your prospect's spam folder is to ask to be added to his address book at the beginning of your relationship. Be sure to provide instructions on how to do this in the emails you send, particularly in the initial email. Deliver what you promise. After getting your prospect's attention with an initial email contact, the next step is to follow through. If you promised an incentive, a free catalog, a blog membership, a special discount, or an e-newsletter sign-up, make sure that it, in fact, happens. Make it reader-friendly. The best small business emails are those that display your business's compelling personality to the recipient, one that makes you interesting to the reader. Content is king in accomplishing this. Here are some tips to help you make your content more inviting. Write a short, snappy subject line. Your open rate depends on it. Be friendly, interesting, and unique. No boilerplate copy allowed. Make your content relevant. Cover current events, new ideas, the latest trends. Avoid controversial issues like politics, 
unless they directly and clearly relate to what you're selling. Use imagery that matches your words. Make it visual. Keep it short, then shorten it again. Email newsletter marketing. Email newsletters are the next step up from email marketing. Similar to email marketing, asking for permission is the first step in the process. Sending e-newsletters without permission will have a negative effect on the recipient and on your business. The delete button and spam reporting will not be far behind. Your email newsletter must be visually attractive, easy to view, and offer a balance of friendly messaging and product-based content. While your readers may want to know what's new with your business, their time is valuable which means they want a quick and easy read. A professional and successful email newsletter will include a customized and friendly introduction that gives quick info on what's included in the newsletter, photography, imagery, or graphics that punctuate the content, timely tips and product info, special events, new promotions, and ways to engage, a customer story or interesting info on someone who is part of your business, if you use an email template from a service provider, make sure to track your success by viewing the analytics that are provided. Included should be the number of views, opens, and clicks. A rule of thumb is to send your email newsletter no more than once a month. More frequent than once a month is too frequent, both for the reader to read and for you to prepare. Blogging. Online blogging can be a powerful tool when done professionally. Blogs can position you as an industry authority as well as a brand personality. Well-written blogs can drive traffic to your website, and they can initiate communications with the recipient. Blog writing is not easy, however. An accomplished writer is a prerequisite. Effective blog writing is both art and science and requires all the elements of good writing, including vocabulary, grammar, and attention to detail. If your blog writer isn't an accomplished writer, your blog is destined to fail. Consistency. It's not enough to write a blog when something important happens or when you're in the mood. Instead, create an annual calendar based on your business's seasonality, product availability, and trends. A calendar doesn't mean you can't jump in and make a change when something new pops up, but blog writing needs an overall plan which feeds the calendar. Don't schedule your blogs too frequently. They require a lot of time to prepare, even for an experienced writer. A weekly blog, 52 blogs a year, would require a prolific and skilled writer. If your writer is not experienced, we suggest an every two-week blogging schedule. Compelling headlines. If your headline isn't clever and snappy, it doesn't matter how good the content is, your article won't be read nearly as much. Research shows that you have only eight seconds to engage and interest a reader in your blog. Numbers and lists make for attention-getting headlines. Examples include five unexpected places to hang your hammock or ten ways to make more money on your tax return. Share. Most successful business bloggers will tell you that only 30% of their time is spent on writing the blog. The other 70% is dedicated to promotion. Thus, your blogging strategy needs to incorporate the other promotion strategies that are part of your online marketing toolkit. Here are some ideas on how to tie your blogging strategy into the rest of your online marketing strategy through the sharing of links and posts. Use your email marketing campaign to promote your blog and direct readers to read specific blogs or sign up for the series. Tease the information in your latest blog in your e-newsletters. Share your blog link in your social media channels. Have family, friends, and employees share and like your blog posts. Networking can be defined as connecting with people to make good things happen. Networking offers a host of benefits, the two most obvious being the opportunity to promote your products or services and the opportunity for you to learn from those with whom you network. These two benefits are the primary reasons that organizations such as the Chamber of Commerce, the Rotary, and Toastmasters exist. 
Think about using the networks you already have. Your friends, your relatives, your alma mater, your church, your children's school, your neighborhood, and the social organizations you belong to are all viable networks. With a little priming, being proactive, many of your existing networks will be happy to give your product or service a try. All you have to do is initiate the priming. This priming can come in many forms, a telephone call, a flyer in the mail, an email, social media postings, mentions, or even a casual mention during a conversation following a school event. All these communication methods are viable parts of the network priming process, and all of them are available at little cost. Remember, be thoughtful and careful when networking with the people you know. People are busy and bombarded daily with tons of advertising, solicitations, and spam email. Aren't you? The last thing most people want is to be accosted by a salesperson in what they thought were the friendly, safe confines of a school or church. Start with a low-key approach. Assemble a one-page summary or a simple flyer of your company's products or services and mail or email copies to people you know. Tip. You can improve your network priming with these additional tips. At the beginning of every year, make a goal for yourself to add one more network to your current stable of contacts. The most obvious way to do this, given today's web-based trends, is to start using social media tools such as Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter. Make sure that you have a professional-looking business card and don't be shy about handing it out. Folks should be able to discern exactly what business you're in through the combination of your company name and your tagline, both of which should appear on your business card. Be sure to follow up every networking opportunity. A telephone call or a letter the next day reminds your networking prospects of your business and shows them that you manage it professionally. Remember that networking works both ways. Help another small business within your network and you can usually expect that the other business will eventually help you. What do you think when you hear a radio ad that says the Greasy Spoon Cafe serves the best burgers in town, but five minutes later, a friend tells you that Danny's Diner really serves the best burgers? Who are you going to believe, the radio ad or your friend? If you're like most people, you'll believe your friend. After all, Radio ads are scripted and paid advertising. Not so with friends. They have no script and generally no agenda, which makes them a credible resource. Such is the power of word-of-mouth referrals. The problem, of course, is that you can't dictate the script of a referral the way you can a radio ad. If Danny's hamburgers aren't up to snuff, Danny's would be better off if its customers kept their mouths shut. Word-of-mouth referrals Tell it the way the customer sees it, not as the business owner would like him to see it. So make sure your product or service is great before people start talking. Remember, you don't have to hire an ad agency or media consultant to make word-of-mouth promotion work for you. You can do it yourself, for a price that's definitely right. If you take care of your customers in the early stages of your business's life and provide an easy feedback mechanism, the referrals from satisfied customers should take care of you and your business in the future. Tip. Every time you serve a satisfied customer, follow up the sale by calling the satisfied customer or asking her to fill out some feedback, making sure she was satisfied with the transaction. Ask for the name of one referral, potential customer. Additionally, whenever a new customer does business with you, Ask how he heard about your company. When the customer replies that he was referred to you by, say, Harry, make sure that the next time Harry stops by, he gets a sincere thank you and possibly a discount or some other offer of value. Rewarding Harry's behavior isn't necessarily a new trick in the promotional game, but it sure is an effective one. Media advertising. Our definition of advertising is a program of paid messages designed to inform large numbers of prospective consumers of the benefits of your product or service. Although the ultimate long-term purpose of advertising is to persuade the consumer to think well of your business 
and to purchase your product or service, some short-term advertising strategies may focus on the achievement of specific objectives. For instance, you may want to attract attendance at events, win sales within a certain time period, or gain name recognition for a new business. Good advertising is about targeting the right message and the right market with repetition and consistency. Mention Nike and people think, just do it. Geico is where 15 minutes can save you 15% or more on your auto insurance. And McDonald's has people singing, I'm loving it. None of these slogans became implanted in consumer minds via a one-shot advertising blitz or a slogan of the month effort. Rather, they became well-known thanks to focused and consistent message projection over time and through all forms of media, including traditional, social, and guerrilla marketing channels. Remember, view advertising as an important investment rather than a dreaded expense. When you budget money to put your message in front of prospective customers with effective frequency, you're making an investment in your future success. Because you're not a large company, you can't afford to spend buckets of money on media advertising. That's why we highly recommend that in the early stages of your business, when cash is generally scarce, you focus on networking and referrals, as well as other low-cost, highly targeted advertising tools, such as email, to get your first customers in the door. Then, when you're ready to venture out into the world of paid advertising, use one of these three methods of developing your advertisements to get the best results in a cost-effective manner. Create your ads in-house, either by writing them yourself or by utilizing an employee who has advertising and creative talent. Make sure, however, that you and others perform serious editing on everything that goes out your door. Mistakes or misspellings in advertising materials reflect poorly on the advertiser and will turn off some buyers. Work with freelance copywriters, designers, media buyers, or other resource professionals. Contract projects on an as-needed basis and maintain responsibility for continuity, accuracy, and timelines. Hire an advertising agency to handle all your advertising needs. Instead of calling a designer when you need a trade booth, a copywriter when you need an ad, or a direct mail house when you need a mailing, turn to a single resource for all projects. A good agency can review all your communications needs, create a single campaign, and produce all the materials you need to prepare the message that works best for you. Yes, you'll pay handsomely for the expertise and service, but in the process, you'll free yourself for other activities. Also, assuming the agency you select is a reputable and qualified one, check references carefully, your advertising program will give you the bang for your buck that you're seeking. To find the advertising resource that's right for you, watch, read, or listen to media, radio, television, magazines, newspapers, and social media, select the ads you like, and then call, contact the business that's doing the advertising and find out who produced or assisted in producing the ad. Or you can simply network with other non-competing small business owners who have advertised and ask questions to determine who and what worked for them. Also, network with your vendors, with your customers, or within your business organizations. Be sure to check your prospective advertisers' credentials and get firm quotes on the cost of their services. Remember, successful advertising requires focus, especially in terms of consumer demographics. If, for instance, you're selling opera star Placido Domingo recordings and advertising on a country and western radio station, you're focusing on the wrong audience. Remember, before you implement one or more of the following advertising techniques, be sure to devise a form or a procedure to track where your new business is coming from. This form should track new customers and find out how they heard about your business. That way, you'll know which of your advertising tools are working and which ones aren't. After all, you won't know whether your chosen option or any other medium you've selected 
is worth your time and money unless you ask. Yellow Pages The original printed Yellow Pages were largely created for and belong to hometown retailers and service suppliers. Looking for a hardware store or somewhere to rent a tux? Many prospective customers historically head for the Yellow Pages first. Now, there are Yellow Page listings and equivalents also online. Be creative with your ad, and remember that bigger, which is what the Yellow Pages sales rep will push for, thanks to the commission, isn't necessarily better. In the Yellow Pages, your ad will be placed right there with all your direct competitors, so your ad needs to set your product or service apart from the rest. Often, your product or service may fit in more than one category. Suppose that you sell screen-printed t-shirts. For an extra fee, you can get listed under t-shirts, advertising, and or screen printing. Tip. If your primary customer audience comes from outside your local area, chances are you have little or no need for Yellow Pages advertising. Opt for a one-line entry because you don't need any more. Yellow Pages ads can be expensive especially when they aren't generating customer traffic. And remember, the importance of Yellow Pages advertising has waned as the wide-reaching tentacles of digital and internet advertising have grown. The lesson? Don't earmark an inordinate amount of your budget to the Yellow Pages. Newspapers. Newspaper advertising generally requires less cash outlay than other forms of advertising. Most ads are black and white, so production costs are low. Newspaper ads are excellent for specific geographic targeting, such as zoned advertising, in which areas of town are targeted for specific advertising content in news sections tailored to them. Most large metropolitan newspapers offer community sections with advertising targeted at local customers as well as placement of ads on their websites. Newspapers, like the Yellow Pages, are experiencing declining numbers as more and more people opt for the web. Newspaper ads have a relatively short lifespan, don't offer the same quality of reproduction that other print advertising tools do, and are oftentimes quickly scanned as opposed to read in detail by readers. Radio. Radio, along with magazines, can help you target a specific demographic group. Also, similar to newspapers, Radio focuses on a specific geographic area. Want to sell acne cream to teens and their parents in Albuquerque? Buy commercial time on the local pop or hard rock station. Additional advantages of radio advertising include the following. Allows for short lead times, the time between when you decide to advertise and when your ad is heard by prospective customers. Reaches people when they're working, traveling in cars, and otherwise going about their daily activities. Provides a proven answer for speedy reaction. Studies indicate that approximately 75% of the responses to radio advertising occur in the first week after airtime. That same immediacy, however, is also the downside of radio advertising. If your prospects aren't tuned in at the exact moment that your ad airs, you're out of luck. That's why radio advertisers use the term frequency when planning their schedules. They aim to have the same ad run over and over, often on several stations in the same market area, hoping to catch the attention of prospective customers at least a few times. Television. Television takes radio advertising one step further, adding video to the audio and thus making more impact on the listener. TV also adds prestige to the business doing the advertising, although with significant costs. Finally, similar to radio ads, good TV ads can evoke a speedy response. TV ad buys, another name for the buying of time to present your ads, come in two packages. Network buys, these involve running your ad on the entire network, think about the ads that run during the Super Bowl, a very expensive proposition. Spot buys or local time buys. These are the ad time slots the network makes available, even during the Super Bowl, for use by local stations. These ads are priced based on the size of the audience reached by the local station 
and the time of day the ad runs. Tip. As with radio ads, TV ads, especially those on a local basis, usually involve a frequency strategy. That is, the ad is intended to be viewed frequently over relatively short periods of time. TV ads also work best when the message is clear, simple, and entertaining. The cost for producing a TV ad can run the gamut. You can have the local station assemble a simple 30-second ad relatively inexpensively. You can have an ad agency produce the ad, the same freelance professional or ad agency that does your print advertising, or you may be able to produce the ad yourself. Tip. After your ad is produced and you're ready to buy time slots on the local station, approach the scheduling process with your facts in hand. Know the age, gender, and programming preferences of your customer prospects. Then either your station representative, the salesperson representing the TV station, or your media buyer, the ad agency that's putting together your ad program, can show you the viewer demographics and other viewing patterns for various programs to help you select a schedule that will target the right audience. Discuss your overall strategy with your media buyer, making sure that she also understands your budget constraints. Local and National Magazines The primary benefit of magazine advertising is that the advertiser can target specific audiences as opposed to newspaper ads where anyone and everyone may be the reader. Run an ad in Scientific American, for example, and you'll attract one kind of audience. Place an ad in GQ, and you'll reach another. An additional advantage of magazine ads is that they have a longer life than the other forms of advertising media, because magazines are often passed from reader to reader. Compare this longer life benefit to radio or television, whose ads are gone after their broadcast cycle. Tip. If you're a manufacturer, for example, a trade magazine can offer a rare degree of consumer-targeted potential. Readers of trade magazines are more than likely potential consumers. In many cases, readers peruse a trade magazine with a specific intent of studying its ads. The downside of magazine advertising is that it's a high-budget item relative to other media, especially if you use high-profile publications. The cost of a full-page, full-color ad in a national magazine can easily hit five figures. Here are a few other interesting notes on magazine advertising. You must plan your magazine ads well in advance. Often, magazine ads must be submitted more than two months before the publication hits the mailbox or newsstand. Cross your fingers when it comes to placement of your ad. Everyone wants front-of-the-magazine, right-hand page placement, but at some magazines, those prime locations usually go to long-standing, multiple-page advertisers who have built up clout over the years. The more upscale the magazine and the bigger its audience, the more expensive the space. Plan accordingly. Website advertising. An increasingly viable advertising option for many small businesses today is a company website. Websites, particularly those intended to be brochureware only and not interactive, are relatively inexpensive, several hundred dollars and up, to establish and maintain. One distinct advantage of online advertising is that it levels the playing field. Even without massive monetary outlays, smaller companies can compete with the big boys by building websites and maintaining them diligently. Tip. As with other advertising media, the success of your website strategy depends on how many people learn of its presence and how frequently your message falls on their eyes. Following are several tips on how to build a strong web presence and keep your web-based customers coming back for more information. Provide up-to-date content. You need to update your website's information on a regular basis, at least monthly or preferably weekly, so that your visitors have an incentive to come back. Commit to functionality. A wide variety of internet tools are available to take your business beyond a basic brochureware intended web presence, enabling you to communicate and collaborate with both customers and potential customers. Ask a local website designer for a list of these tools. Allow for easy navigation. 
Keep the look and the layout clean. If information is difficult to come by, if the flow of your site isn't intuitive, or if the font or the background makes information difficult to read, visitors will move on to the hundreds of other choices on the web. Differentiate your site. Your site needs to stand out by being creative, including both the content and the graphics. When visitors arrive at your homepage, make sure they understand what it is that makes your site and your products or services different from the crowd. Promote your site. Just because you build a site doesn't mean that consumers will visit it. You need to let people know what your site address is and why they should visit your site. Promote your site via your traditional communication efforts and online communication strategies, including Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter. Other advertising vehicles. A wide range of other, usually less expensive, advertising options are available. This range includes such media as billboards and bus ads, and other transportation-oriented media, as well as less professional advertising tools such as flyers. Posters and handbills. Ultimately, the description of your target market, the nature of your message, the depth of your pocketbook, and your own expertise will determine the medium that's best for you. Publicity. Publicity, free advertising through news sources, is especially effective as a promotional tool because people, specifically prospective consumers, tend to give more credibility. To what they read or hear when it comes from news sources, whereas their belief in advertising messages is often tainted with varying degrees of suspicion, understandably. Unlike advertising, you don't pay for publicity. You do, however, have to spend time and money generating it. Typical examples of publicity include feature stories and product or service announcements distributed in media resources. Such as newspapers, business periodicals, television and radio stations, magazines, websites, and blogs, including online magazines and newsletters, as well as links to and from sites that serve those in your target audience. And don't limit your search for publicity to only the business-oriented outlets. Oftentimes, exposure in the news or in human interest stories is even more beneficial. The downside to publicity is that, similar to word-of-mouth advertising, you can't control what's said about your company or your product or service. So, make sure that what you're about to publicize can withstand media scrutiny. The following tips can help you develop free advertising for your business through publicity. Write an article for your local newspaper on a subject that relates to you or your business. If the article is well written and has a special hook, it can bring you the publicity you seek. Give talks or teach classes about your profession or business to local groups. You can go to places such as the Chamber of Commerce, Rotary Club, civic associations, and other groups. Hire a public relations PR firm. PR firms are to publicity what ad agencies are to advertising. Unfortunately, their fees are similar too. Remember, whenever appropriate, send a professional quality photo of yourself and of your event, if there is one, along with any publicity requests. Photos personalize the request, and many papers will use them. As a startup business owner, you should always have a high quality photo of yourself available for when a sudden PR opportunity presents itself. Sending a news release. One frequently utilized tool of publicity is the news release. A news release is a notification of something newsworthy that you send to appropriate newspaper, magazine, radio, and television editors and/or reporters. News releases are appropriate for such occasions as the opening of a new store, the introduction of new products and services, or the procurement of an important new customer or key employee. For the most part, you should send your news releases to the business editor or business reporter. In some cases, however, you may want to send them to the editor of a specific department, such as sports or lifestyle. The best way to determine which editor or reporter to send your news releases to is to look at the bylines on newspaper or magazine public interest articles 
that are about companies similar to yours. You can also listen for the name of the reporter on public interest radio or TV stories. Work diligently to build a relationship with the employee who is the gatekeeper of the kind of publicity you're looking for. Try to make his job easier. Prepare the news release carefully, make sure all the relevant information is included, and write it, and then rewrite it, until you're sure it's as professional as you can make it. Also, don't abuse this relationship after you've established it. Make sure that whatever it is you're submitting is newsworthy and factual. Creating a hook. In most cases, you need some sort of hook to attract publicity. A hook is the characteristic that makes you or your product or service unique and of publicity value. Examples of hooks include an excellent Italian restaurant where the waiters are intentionally rude to patrons or an antique shop with goats in its lobby for visitors to feed. A secondary advantage of having a hook is that it makes your attempts to find publicity easier. A bona fide hook, which of course doesn't need to involve rudeness or something bizarre, will interest most reporters, because media writers will perceive it as something of interest to their readers or viewers. Face it, someone has to sell your products or services. The question is who that selling someone should be. Should the seller be you, an employee hired by you, or a team of employees hired by you? These are examples of an in-house sales force. Should the seller be an outsider, someone who's already calling on your potential customers with related products. This kind of sales is known as outsourcing, and the people who do it are typically called manufacturer's representatives or reps. Using an in-house sales force. An in-house sales force is comprised of salaried or commission-based employees of the company whose products they sell. In-house salespeople are usually hired, trained, or compensated by the company itself. Thus, their mission is to sell only the company's offerings. Remember, the advantage of hiring and maintaining your own sales force is that you can exert direct control over your salespeople, and they, in turn, can direct all their energies towards selling your products or services. The disadvantage of hiring an in-house sales force is that you're picking up 100% of the expenses involved in employing and deploying your salespeople. Therefore, you must be able to find enough sales potential within any given geographical area to financially support the salesperson assigned to it. Most in-house salespeople today are compensated on a commission basis, although recent trends are moving to salary with bonus. Using manufacturer's reps. Manufacturers' reps, also called independent agents, are independent salespeople who carry a line of products from different manufacturers and always get paid a percentage of every sale they make. The collection of products they choose to sell usually is aimed at customers within a given industry. For example, the sales rep who calls on photography stores will pitch products such as film, tripods, and scrapbooks from varied manufacturers. The collection of products from any one manufacturer is called a line, and a typical rep may have anywhere from 1 to 30 lines of products in her bag. Always ask how many lines the rep you're considering is carrying. The more lines in her bag, the less attention yours will get. Some reps are part of a larger rep agency. Others work solo. Manufacturers' reps are paid only for what they sell, in other words, straight commission, and they often cover a large geographic territory depending on the density of population. The commissions they charge vary with the product and the areas they cover. Commissions can range anywhere from as low as 5% on big ticket sales to as much as 25% on small ticket, difficult to sell items. The primary advantages of using manufacturers' reps include the following. You don't have the out-of-pocket expense of maintaining a sales force. No salaries, benefits, or travel expenses. Because the reps are paid solely on commission, if they don't sell your products or services, they don't get paid. Period. Because reps can spread their costs over many manufacturers' lines, 
they can cover a wide geographical area for minimal expense. Networks of manufacturers' reps, both individuals and firms, cover every state in the nation. You can pick and choose until you find the combination you need. Reps can more cost-effectively make small-ticket, low-price tag sales because of their ability to spread their time and expenses over a number of products. This means that when you have a small-ticket product, your reps can afford to sell it to customers in outlying areas, whereas in-house salespeople with only one manufacturer's product in their bag usually can't afford to make the sales call in the first place. The primary disadvantages of hiring manufacturer's reps include the following. You lack control over your reps' activities. After all, you aren't employing them. They're employing themselves. Due to the reps' distance from and non-involvement in your day-to-day -day business, they can't possibly know your product as well as an in-house sales staff, especially if your product is technical in nature. Manufacturers' reps, like all salespeople, have limited time in front of each customer. The products the reps choose to sell during that designated time depend on their perception of how easily they can sell a given product, as well as how much commission they can generate from the transaction. If your product or service is well-established and relatively easy to sell and your customer base is widespread, manufacturer's reps may work well for you. In these cases, the reps will be sure to pull your product out of the bag during a sales call. On the other hand, if you have a relatively new product or one without an established customer base, manufacturer's reps may not give your product the time or attention it needs. Where do you find manufacturer's reps? Look in your industry's trade magazines or visit a trade show within your industry and ask for the manufacturer's rep bulletin board or contact the Manufacturers Agents National Association for the latest directory containing the names of manufacturers rep organizations around the country. Making the decision. You sacrifice control for expense when you employ a manufacturers rep in lieu of an in-house sales force. Not surprisingly, the correct decision depends on your situation. The following equations can help you decide which of the two options is best for you. Easy products to sell plus limited finances equals manufacturer's reps. Difficult products to sell plus adequate finances equals your own sales staff. Small ticket item plus wide territory equals manufacturer's reps. High ticket item plus small territory equals your own sales staff. Cash flow. To pay your bills, you need to manage the money, cash, you have going out and coming in. That is, your cash flow. Before you can have cash flowing out, you must have cash flowing in. When your cash flows out in excess of what flows in, your business is heading for trouble. To understand the basic concept of cash flow, you first need to distinguish between the following two oft-confused terms, cash flow an operating term that describes the movement of money, cash, checks, electronic debits, and credits in and out of your business. Profitability, an accounting term that refers to the capability of your business to generate more sales dollars than what it costs to run your business. When a business is profitable, profits don't necessarily accumulate in the form of cash. Instead, they can take the form of an increase in other non-cash assets, such as inventory, accounts receivable, equipment, or real estate. Yes, those profits may once have been in the form of cash, but somewhere along the line, you may make the decision to shift that cash into another asset, purchasing additional inventory or buying a piece of equipment, for example. In this manner, your business can be profitable in accounting terms but still be short of cash in the checkbook. Although an increase in cash is only one of the many possible results of profitability, it is, by far, the most important result because cash fuels the day-to-day -day operation of your business. If you've chosen to spend too much cash on purchasing inventory and equipment, or if you've been slow in collecting your accounts receivable, you may not have enough cash to pay your vendors and compensate your employees. After all, 
you can't pay them with inventory or equipment. Ironically, some profitable, in accounting terms, businesses, have entered bankruptcy because their owners made the wrong choices when allocating the business's precious cash. Instead of accumulating it, they, knowingly or unknowingly, spent it on non-liquid assets. And then, lo and behold, the bills came due and the cupboards were bare. Your business's bank account, or money market fund, is the obvious measure of today's cash. Do you have enough money in it to pay today's bills and meet today's payroll? And will you still have money left over when the day is done? Remember, the difficulty comes in projecting how much cash you'll need in the future. Because every business must be concerned with more than just what's happening today in terms of cash availability, projecting tomorrow's cash flow is an important task. To do that, you need to consider questions like the following. Will you have enough cash to meet next Friday's payroll? Will you have enough cash to pay that big vendor invoice that's due the following Monday? Will you have enough cash to pay the bank loan payment, the upcoming utility bills, and the real estate taxes that will be due at the end of the month? Questions like these, and the answers they beg, point out the need for preparing cash flow projections, forecasts of how much cash you'll have over a given future time frame. Some businesses project cash flow for 30 days out, some for six months, and some for an entire year in advance. To project cash flow accurately, you need to polish up the old crystal ball because you're about to make many important predictions. For example, you must predict your future sales, the rate at which you'll collect the money that's due you from those sales, the dollar amount of your upcoming payrolls, the dollar amount of vendor invoices to be paid in the next day, week, month, six months, or even year. The better your predictions, the more accurate a forecast you can prepare. You can prepare your cash flow projections for the next day, next week, next month, next year, or any combination thereof. Predictions for longer time periods, although potentially useful, are likely to be fuzzier and less accurate than predictions for shorter time periods. We recommend that you make your cash flow projections for at least six months out and then update them at least once each month, always staying six months out. That way, you'll spot problem periods earlier and be able to adjust to them more quickly. Although most small businesses don't generate cash flow projections daily, you should be tracking cash on a monthly basis. After all, no matter how small or uncomplicated your business happens to be, cash is key. We can guarantee you one thing. At some point in your business career, you will have cash flow problems. Wouldn't you rather anticipate the problem before it happens than let it blindside you? Most accountants have a pre-formatted cash flow projections worksheet available for their clients to use. Whether you use their worksheet or something you create on your own, make sure you understand the concept of cash flow because it's one of the most important and least understood financial concepts that a small business owner must know. The concept is as simple as the concept behind maintaining a checkbook. For example, knowing the balance in your checking account given the inflows and outflows that you know are coming. Whether manual or computer-based, the accounting system you use should ultimately generate two financial statements, the profit and loss statement, also known as the income statement, and the balance sheet. Both of these statements are produced at the end of a business's accounting period, usually monthly, quarterly, or annually. We recommend that you prepare, or have prepared, your financial statements as frequently as possible, with monthly statements usually being the most useful. If your accounting system allows you to generate your financial statements internally, we suggest that you generate your statements monthly. If monthly statements are impossible for some reason, Quarterly statements will do, but don't fall into the trap that many small businesses do by generating your statements only once or twice a year. Financial statements function primarily as a management tool, and you can't go 365 days without paying attention to the information they provide. The profit and loss statement, P&L, adds all the revenues of your business and subtracts all the operating expenses. 
thereby providing you with a figure that represents what's left over, the profits. If the total expenses exceeded the total revenues, your business would have a loss rather than a profit. The P&L measures the results of operations of your business over a given time period, typically a month, a quarter, or a year. Choosing a P&L format. When you sit down with your bookkeeper and or tax advisor to design your financial statement format, always remember the cardinal rule of business numbers. Any given number is meaningful only when compared to another number. You need to compare the current year's figures to other numbers, last year's actual performance, or this year's budget, or, preferably, both. You can use a wide variety of formats in presenting a P&L. We recommend that you use a four-column format for both the P&L and the balance sheet. This four-column format allows you to quickly and easily compare the three key figures, prior year, budget, and current year. The fourth column measures the percentage increase or decrease, in parentheses, between the current year and prior year. The process you use to arrive at a P&L's net income conclusion isn't difficult to understand. Just follow these two easy steps. One, subtract from the gross sales the cost of the goods that were included in those sales. What's left is the gross margin on those sales, the difference between what it costs you to produce your product or service and the price you charge for it. In other words, the gross income before subtracting operating expenses. Two, subtract from that number all the operating expenses incurred during that accounting period, including all selling and administrative expenses. The number left over is the net income. As you can see, the trick is not so much in assembling the P&L, but in retaining and retrieving all the figures that go into it. The better your accounting system, the easier this process will be. The balance sheet. The balance sheet provides a snapshot of a company's financial position at any given point in time. As with the P&L, the concept behind a balance sheet isn't complex. Quite simply, the balance sheet is a list of what your business owns, assets, minus what your business owes, liabilities, with the resulting difference being what your business is worth, net worth. This net worth figure is also commonly referred to as book value. Remember, the P&L is designed to analyze profitability issues, sales, margins, and expenses. The purpose of the balance sheet, on the other hand, is to analyze an entirely different issue, resource dollar allocation. Did you decide to allocate your dollars to increasing inventory, to paying off loans, or to accumulating cash? The small business owner makes many asset allocation decisions over the course of the year. The balance sheet provides a year-end snapshot that summarizes the history of those decisions. By comparing the current year column on the balance sheet with the prior year column, you can readily determine what has happened to the mixture of assets and liabilities over the year. In other words, how a company's management decided to allocate the company's resources. When using a four-column balance sheet format, one might study the percent change compared to prior year column. If the total current assets didn't change appreciably, two of the categories within the current assets category, cash and inventory, might have. If you use your financial statements as a management tool to guide and direct your business, the picture changes. In some cases, your financial statements may even pay for themselves if the actions you take because of the lessons they provide result in increased profits and or cash flow. For example, in a four-column P&L statement, if a business owner plugged the salary increases into the budget before making them and been fully aware of the impending negative impact on the company's profitability, she may have given a second thought to this decision. Ditto with a balance sheet. If the owner made the decision to increase inventory and pay down her long-term debt, had the owner plugged those figures into the balance sheet budget, she would have understood the impact these decisions would have on the company's cash account and probably would have altered her decisions. Such is the power of using financial statements and budgets. 
They allow you to see the results of your decisions before you make them. Every small business owner should use the numbers and statistics that the business generates to help make important decisions. Understanding Key Ratios and Percentages Before you can take the numbers generated by the P&L and balance sheet and turn them into meaningful management tools, you need to consider two overall points about the numbers, ratios, and percentages that come from those financial statements. Comparisons work best. Your company may have what appears to be a respectable percentage of net profit on its sales, but if that percentage is less than it was during the same period the preceding year, trouble may lie ahead. Numbers are most effective when you can use them to identify trends, and identifying trends always requires a comparison of numbers over time. Acceptable numbers in one industry may not be acceptable in another. Industries vary widely in the numbers they generate. For example, if you're in the software business, you may be disappointed with a 15% profit return on your sales dollar. If you're in the grocery store business, however, you'd probably be ecstatic with a 5% profit return on sales. If you don't know the acceptable ratios and percentages in your industry, contact your appropriate trade association. Most trade associations can give you the benchmark ratios and percentages that you need to know to compare your own business to industry averages. We strongly suggest that you learn how to extract the key ratios and percentages from your financial statements by yourself instead of depending on your bookkeeper or tax advisor to do so. The process itself gives you a better idea of where the numbers come from and how you can use the financial statements for other ratios and percentages that may be meaningful to your individual business. Although any ratio or percentage alone won't give you all the information you need to become a sophisticated financial manager, the knowledge of how they all work together will make you much more effective as an owner-manager. Return on Sales, ROS. Return on Sales, ROS, is a percentage determined by dividing net pre-tax profits from the P&L by total sales, also from the P&L. The resulting figure measures your company's overall efficiency in converting a sales dollar into a profit dollar. ROS very much depends on what type of business you operate. Remember, ROS is an excellent figure on which you and your employees can focus. It's relatively easy to track, understand, and explain. Some businesses use this percentage as a company-wide scorecard to help their employees understand how the businesses make money, thus motivating them to do their part in assuring and improving profitability. Most employees think their businesses make much, much more money than they really do. Return on Equity, ROE. Return on Equity, ROE, is a percentage determined by dividing pre-tax profits from the P&L by equity net worth from the balance sheet. The resulting figure represents the return you've made on the equity dollars that are effectively invested in your business. Over several years, if your return on equity isn't higher than 5% or thereabouts, which is the average return on money invested in such secure investments as short-term, high-quality bonds, you may want to consider selling your business and investing the proceeds in bonds. Your return would be similar, but your risk and the work involved would be much less. This assumes, of course, that you're in business to make money. If, however, you're motivated by something else, creativity, growth, independence, or if you simply like owning your own business, you may be content with minuscule earnings, even though you can make a similar or better financial return elsewhere. Note, both ROS and ROE are impacted heavily by the amount of money the owner decides to take out of the business in the form of salaries, bonuses, and benefits. Obviously, the more taken out, the lower the ROS and ROE percentages will be. Gross margin. Gross margin is a percentage determined by subtracting your cost of goods sold from the P&L from total sales, also from the P&L. This figure represents your business's effective overall markup on products sold before deducting your manufacturing and or service providing expenses. 
How high or low your gross margin is depends on your industry, your business, your pricing strategy, and the products or services you're selling. The trade association for your industry can give you industry-wide benchmark numbers for gross margin. Remember, trend is especially important with gross margin. Over time, you want to see an increasing rather than decreasing gross margin. Current ratio. Current ratio is a ratio determined by dividing current assets from the balance sheet by current liabilities, also from the balance sheet. The resulting figure measures your business's liquidity, the ability to raise immediate cash from the sale of your assets. Thus, this ratio is of great interest, especially to your lenders and or outside investors. The higher the current ratio, the more liquid your business. Generally, current ratios in excess of 2 to 1 are considered very healthy. Anything less than 1 to 1 is in the danger zone. Again, trend is especially important here. Over time, you want to see an increasing rather than decreasing current ratio. Debt to equity ratio. The debt to equity ratio is a ratio determined by dividing equity, net worth, from the balance sheet by debt, total liabilities, also from the balance sheet. The resulting ratio indicates, in effect, how much of the business is owned by the owners represented by equity, net worth, and how much is owned by its creditors, represented by debt, total liabilities. Generally, a one-to-one -one ratio is considered healthy. Anything less is questionable. Remember, keeping the debt-to-equity ratio within the healthy one-to-one -one parameter is of paramount importance. For example, when the debt-to-equity ratio exceeds 1.0 or 100%, such cash-draining options as adding inventory, hiring new employees, and buying new equipment should be put on hold until the ratio becomes more lender-friendly. Inventory Turn Inventory turn is the number of times your inventory turns over in a year. You determine the number by dividing your total cost of goods sold for the year from the P&L by your average inventory, beginning inventory, plus ending inventory divided by 2. For example, if your beginning inventory on January 1st was $100,000 and your ending inventory on December 31st was $150,000, your average inventory would be $125,000. Your inventory turn shows how well you're managing your inventory. The higher the number, the more times your inventory has turned, which is always preferable. The number of times your inventory turns is highly dependent on your industry, manufacturer, wholesaler, or retailer, and your role in it. Typical inventory turns can range anywhere from 5 to 20 times a year. Consult your trade association for inventory turn ratios that apply to your industry. Number of days in receivables. You determine the number of days in receivables, that is, the average length of time between selling a product or service and getting paid for it, by first computing your average sales day. Divide your total sales for the period, from the P&L, by the number of days in that period. For a year, use 365. Then divide your average sales day into your current account's receivable balance, from the balance sheet. The resulting figure gives you the number of days in your receivables. Generally speaking, Fewer than 30 days in receivables is considered excellent. Between 30 and 45 days is acceptable, and more than 45 is cause for concern. EBITDA. EBITDA is an acronym that stands for Earnings Before Interest, Taxes, Depreciation, and Amortization. EBITDA is computed by adding back interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization to net income. Those four expenses are non-operating expenses. So after adding them back, you have a number that represents the pure operating results of your business. The EBITDA number is always used in transactions that relate to buying and selling a business. In other words, valuing a business. Managing your inventory. The opportunities to improve profitability by the efficient handling of inventory are endless. 
Inventory isn't gray, like marketing, or in the future, like sales. It's here today and resting on your shelves, available to touch, feel, and count. As a result, if you improve your efficiency at handling inventory, your business can have a double financial benefit. Profitability, the less inventory you have to write off, the more profitable you become. Cash flow, the fewer dollars you have tied up in inventory, the more cash you have in your bank account. Aside from texting while driving, accumulating excess inventory is the quickest and easiest way we know of to get into trouble. Excess inventory and its long list of hidden horrors have turned many a healthy small business into an ailing one. Unlike getting rid of employees who aren't performing, you can't give inventory that isn't performing a pink slip and send it out the door. Nor can you step up your collection effort with your inventory as you can with slow-moving receivables. Non-performing inventory just sits there collecting dust and generally depreciates. Inventory can disappear in several unsatisfactory ways, including internal theft by your employees, external theft by your customers, and at the hands of the most virulent scourge of them all, obsolescence. If inventory is an integral part of your small business, use the following tips to manage it effectively. Gather information on past purchasing and sales transactions. Preventing inventory accumulation starts with the person doing the purchasing. The more information on past purchasing and sales transactions that person has, the better his future purchasing decisions can be. To gather this information, do the following. Make sure that you buy the best inventory tracking software you can afford because inventory's past performance is usually the best indicator of how it will perform in the future. A good small business tax advisor should be able to help you decide which software choice is best for you. If you aren't computerized, ask your accountant to help you develop a manual system. If you plan to enter the retail business, make sure that you also buy a point-of-sale program, a system that adjusts inventory as a result of cash register transactions. The system should be sophisticated enough to capture the information needed for you to accurately track your inventory. Divide your inventory into small, manageable pieces. Pay especially close attention to those pieces where you have the most financial exposure. Remember, Inventory is subject to the 80-20 rule. You usually get about 80% of your sales from 20% of your inventory units. Pay special attention to closely tracking that 20%. Make sure that you have a workable system and qualified employees in place at the inventory handling corners, shipping and receiving. Most inventory disappearance problems can be identified at one of these two positions. If your inventory system is manual, ask an experienced tax practitioner to help you establish a workable digital or electronic system. Take frequent physical inventories. To determine whether you're having inventory shrinkage problems, and, if so, how significant they are, count the items in your inventory and compare your physical count to your financial records. If you divide your inventory into small, manageable pieces, you can more readily determine where the shrinkage is occurring. Taking a physical inventory is the only way to ensure that the gross margin figures on your P&L are correct. We suggest that most businesses take a thorough physical inventory at least twice a year, and preferably four or even six times. When selecting suppliers, don't simply settle on the supplier with the lowest price. Include delivery time and shipping dependability at or near the top of your criteria. After all, the shorter the delivery time and the more dependable the vendor, the less of that vendor's inventory you'll have to carry. Some vendors allow returns on inventory you've purchased from them, often charging a restocking fee of some sort. In most cases, a vendor's willingness to take back items that don't sell is an added benefit, assuming that the restocking fee isn't too high. Collecting your accounts receivable. Banks aren't the only institutions in the business of lending money. Most small businesses lend money, too. The primary difference between the two, however, is that when banks lend money, known as loans, to their customers, 
they charge interest. When small businesses lend money via accounts receivable to their customers, they usually don't charge interest. Think about it. When customers buy your product, unless your business deals only in cash, you usually give them 30 days to pay the invoice. During those 30 days, the customer not only has your product, but also, in effect, has the cash that's due you, the same cash that you can otherwise use to reduce your debt, pay your bills, or invest to your benefit. Today's business culture places the customer on a pedestal, as well it should. After all, someone has to purchase your products or services. But the word customer is incomplete. The correct phrase should be paying customer. Today's successful entrepreneurs know that a customer isn't a desirable customer until she has paid the bill. The following list presents our time-tested collection of tips on how to find and do business with paying customers. Use a credit application. Design and use your own credit application. Ask one of your vendors if you can use its application as a sample. Make sure that every potential customer fills one out before you ship an order or provide your service. The credit application you use should include, among other things, the customer's references, other vendors used by the customer, the name of the customer's bank, the person responsible for accounts payable, and the name of the owner, president, CEO, the person ultimately responsible for the customer's debts. And be sure to check the references provided in the application. Evaluate every applicant. Ask yourself these questions about every prospective customer who submits a credit application. And if the answer to any of these questions is no, feel free to wave goodbye to the prospective sale. Does this applicant have the ability to pay? Has she indicated by her past actions a willingness to pay on time? Can you make a reasonable profit on sales to this account? Ask for a financial statement. Don't be afraid to ask for a financial statement before shipping to a first-time customer. Can you imagine a bank lending you money for your business without first asking you for a financial statement? Check credit. You can bet that your good vendors check your credit. You should check your customer's credit, too. Remember that the granting of credit is a privilege. In effect, you're lending money to the person requesting it. Grant credit the way banks do, with care. Establish terms. No sale should be made without first establishing credit terms. Terms should work for both parties. But remember your signature on the bank's guarantee when a customer wants you to carry his receivables for long periods of time. Your bank won't back off its terms. Why should you? Managing your accounts receivable. Every successful small business needs someone dedicated to the collection of accounts receivable. In the early stages of the business, that someone is almost always the entrepreneur or founder. In later stages, that responsibility may be delegated to a bookkeeper, controller, or chief financial officer, CFO. But whoever that person happens to be, he must be passionate about collecting the monies due the business. After you've properly established your accounts receivable record-keeping functions, you need to figure out how to manage them. The following tips can help you do just that. Bill promptly. Bill the same day you ship, or, in the case of a service business, the same day you fulfill the customer's order or the terms of the contract. If you wait until the end of the month to prepare and or mail invoices, you further increase the number of days before you'll receive the cash. Track the time it takes your customers to pay their bills. You need to age all outstanding receivables at least once a month. In other words, you need to compute the number of days that every receivable has been outstanding. Companies where money is tight generate aging lists every day. Creating an aging list reminds you who's in control of a large amount of your company's cash. An acceptable age of a receivable, in most industries anyway, is 30 days. Danger signals should appear after a receivable exceeds 45 days. Begin collections promptly. Don't wait until your receivables are more than 90 days old to kick in your collection procedures. Do so while the invoice is still warm, no more than 45 days. 
utilize a carrying charge or interest charge. Why shouldn't you charge interest on overdue balances? After all, you're expected to pay a carrying charge to many of your vendors when you exceed your payment terms. Review your credit card agreement if you have any doubts on this one. Don't charge anything less than 10% annualized. A relatively high interest rate will ensure that you get the overdue account's attention. Don't ship to non-payers. Don't continue to ship to customers who don't pay in accordance with your terms. Involve the boss. Consider picking up the phone yourself when the bill paying stalling becomes noticeable. A call from the owner or boss may be more effective than a call from the bookkeeper. Use a collection agency only as a last resort. Collection agencies are expensive, charging up to 50% of the receivables for their services. Also, collection agencies aren't known for their consideration and politeness. Be prepared to kiss your customer goodbye forever if you choose to hand your slow-paying account over to an agency. Remember, your account's receivables represent cash, and cash is the ultimate measure of your business's liquidity. Liquidity is the first place lenders and investors look when appraising the health of a business. Make sure that your receivables are current before showing your financial statements to people who have a reason for reading them. Every small business owner spends a significant amount of time trying to increase the business's profitability, the difference between revenue, the money you take in, and expenses, the money you pay out. No one succeeds in increasing profitability all the time, no matter how hard he tries. Some succeed often enough to grow a small business into a larger one. Some succeed just often enough to survive. And, unfortunately, some don't succeed at all. Remember, the three ways to increase your business's profitability are to decrease expenses, to increase gross margin, to increase sales. You can do all three at the same time. That is, if luck and the time you have to devote to the task are on your side. However, our advice would be to pick the easiest option first, decreasing expenses, then proceed to the second easiest, increasing gross margin, and then, finally, to the toughest, increasing sales. Unfortunately, too many entrepreneurs start with the sales option first. After all, Increasing sales is more fun than cutting expenses. While we applaud their gusto, they're approaching the process from the wrong end and won't see the same immediate results they'd get if they started with expenses. Instead of proceeding by trial and error, you can use a thorough understanding of how these profitability-improving options work to determine exactly what to do when your profits aren't what they should be. The biggest advantage that comes from decreasing or controlling your expenses is that expense cuts generally have a direct and short-term impact on the bottom line. For every dollar you save by cutting or eliminating an expense, you earn an extra dollar of profit. Sure, increasing sales is another way to increase profits, but an extra dollar in sales may bring in only 25 cents of profit. We explain more about that shortly. Of course, not all expense cutting is equal. It's one thing to cut your expenses by changing your internet service provider, but if that change results in slower service, does it make sense? Where lower costs involve lower quality, the result of that lower quality needs to be factored into the decision. So although we're strong advocates of operating a lean business, you must be thoughtful about where and how you reduce your expenses. You need to consider all the effects of cost-cutting, not just the short-term, bottom-line effects, before you make any cuts. Remember, controlling expenses is a cultural issue, which means that it's a lead-by-example issue that begins with you, the business owner, and carries over to your employees, presuming that you've hired the right ones. From the day you open your business's doors, you must pay close attention to managing its expenses, being careful not to spend money carelessly, and being tactfully critical of those who do. If the boss sets the right example, the rest of the company is certain to follow. That's how a company culture is established and flourishes. Zero-based budgeting. 
After you determine what kind of expense controlling culture you want to set up in your business and then make the commitment to act accordingly, your next step is to introduce a zero-based budgeting program. Zero-based budgeting requires that you begin each year's annual budget process by setting each expense category at zero. In other words, you don't assume that the dollar amounts in the preceding year's expense account were needed. You question every dollar that went into that expense account. The zero-based budgeting approach contrasts with the way many businesses budget expenses. Most businesses add a percentage increase to the preceding year's expenses, with the rate of the prior year's inflation increase being the most frequently used common multiplier. If last year's inflation rate was 3%, for instance, many businesses just plug in 3% increases to arrive at this year's budget. The primary advantage of budgeting by the percentage increase method is that it's quick and easy. The primary disadvantage is that it carries last year's fat into this year's menu. Ditto with next year's menu, and so on, forever unless that expense category is eventually thoroughly questioned through the zero-based budgeting technique. Here's an example of how zero-based budgeting works. Suppose it's time to budget your telephone expense for the year. The quick and easy solution is to take the preceding year's telephone expense figure, add 3%, or whatever inflation is, and move on to the next line item on the P&L. However, the zero-based budgeter's job is to examine and evaluate the company's telephone needs to determine what kinds of calls need to be made and then to contact alternative carriers, collect quotes on their services, and award the business to a less expensive but comparable quality provider. Often, the additional time you spend budgeting will be rewarded with a decrease in expenses as opposed to an inflation-based increase, trimming costs. In addition to zero-based budgeting, effective control of expenses requires understanding the 80-20 rule as it applies to expenses. The 80-20 rule maintains that you can usually find 80% of wasted expense dollars in 20% of the expense categories. As you create your budget, challenge expenses in all categories, large and small. You can usually find quick and easy dollars to save by rooting around in such overlooked expense categories as utilities, travel and entertainment, insurance, and the compost heap of them all, the miscellaneous category. The following tips provide a framework in which you can effectively control your expenses. Avoid overstaffing. Finding and hiring a good employee is costly, and after you've hired one, unhiring her is not only difficult, but also expensive. Use outside contractors, temporary services, and part-timers if you're on the fence about the need to hire a full-time employee. Automate where possible. Technology is usually cheaper than people, and it can be depreciated. When possible, and when doing so won't compromise the quality of your products or services, purchase software in lieu of hiring additional employees. Functions such as accounting, inventory control, accounts receivable, and payroll lend themselves to automation. Don't wait until a crisis arrives to do something about your expenses. Institute an expense control program when things are going well. You don't have to wait until the roof caves in. Be motivated by efficiency, not by fear. Put the responsibility for controlling expenses where it belongs, in the hands of the employees who spend the money. Also, Make them accountable for their actions. Reward them when they meet their goals and provide corrective feedback when they don't. That's Management 101. The preceding tips are intended to provide you with an overview of how to control your expenses. Following are several cost-controlling measures intended not only to give you specific ideas, but also to put you in the frame of mind for getting serious about managing your expenses. Ask for price quotes before you obligate yourself to services. This is true for everything from lawyers, accountants, and financial advisors to computer repair people, plumbers, and consultants. Often the quotes won't hold up, but they'll give you a basis on which to negotiate subsequent charges. 
Also, make sure that you always ask for itemized invoices. Don't pay unnecessary bank charges. Question the fees on your statements. Shop around if your bank is charging more than competitors for services. Just about everything is negotiable, including bank charges. Shop your telephone service every year or so. Everyone is discounting telephone services as technology and deregulation make prices more competitive. If you have employees, review your experience modification factor with your insurance agent. Your experience modification factor is the tool that determines your workers' compensation insurance payment. Speaking of insurance agents, how long has it been since you've shopped for insurance, both liability and health? Given the relentless upward trend of health insurance and the seemingly endless changes in the healthcare system, our recommendation is that you annually price your business's health insurance policies and compare those prices with other policies out there. We're not suggesting that price should be your only consideration or that after you've found a lower price, you should automatically wave goodbye to your current supplier. Rather, we're suggesting that you be aware of the going rate in the marketplace and, where appropriate, either change suppliers or press your current supplier to reassess the prices it's charging you. Squeaky wheels get the grease, and the effective control of expenses is no exception to this rule. The preceding tips are a few of the many possible ways for you to control your business's expenses. Remember that effective expense control isn't a one-time event. It's an ongoing occurrence whose success or failure lies entirely in your hands. Increasing margins. As we've mentioned, margin is the difference between sales price and the cost of the goods or services sold. Gross margin is the accounting term you see on the balance sheet to mean the same thing. Here's a simple illustration of how to understand what the margin is on a given transaction. If your product sells for $15 and the cost of that product, including shipping charges, is $10, your margin is 33%, the $5 in markup divided by the $15 gross sales price. Your margin dollars are $5, the difference between the $10 cost and the $15 sales price. Remember, you can increase margins in three ways. By raising prices, by lowering the cost of the goods or services sold, by doing both. Regardless, the magic of increasing margins is that, similar to decreasing expenses, every dollar of income derived from the margin increase ends up as additional profit, assuming no reduction in sales. Continuing with the preceding example, if you raise the price of the product from $15 to $16, the margin jumps from 33% to 37.5%, and the margin dollars increase from $5 to $6. Because increasing prices generally costs very little, nearly the entire $1 of the price increase will be realized as profit, again assuming no reduction in purchasing from customers. Increasing margins by lowering the cost of goods or services sold is a little more difficult. If you're a manufacturer, you must decrease the cost of manufacturing your product either by cutting your labor costs or by reducing the cost of the raw materials you purchase from vendors. If you're a wholesaler or retailer, you must reduce the cost of the goods you purchase for resale. Similar to reducing prices, this method of increasing margins also results in a dollar-on-the-dollar -dollar recapture of profitability. Consider the case of the small business that does $500,000 in sales a year. If the owner, at the beginning of the year, decides to increase the prices of his products by an average of 1%, that would mean an additional $5,000 in profits at the end of the year. An average increase of 2% would add $10,000, and 5% would add a solid $25,000. Again, all this assumes that the price increases don't reduce sales. Generally speaking, small business owners are more reluctant to raise prices than they should be. Too many times, your humble authors have witnessed reluctant small business owners tremble in the course of reasonably raising prices, only to learn that their customers don't care 
as long as the quality of the relationship endures. The tolerance of your customers to accept price increases depends on such issues as competition, alternative products, and, most of all, the customer relationships you maintain. We strongly recommend that every small business owner review the margins on every product or service at least once a year. Determine a time of the year when raising prices makes the most sense, usually at the beginning of the business's fiscal year. Mark that date on your calendar in ink, and when the time comes, start with your lowest priced item and work up. Analyze the percentage of price increase on each individual item. Don't simply increase prices by using an across-the-board percentage increase. Also, be sure to aim for higher margins on the lower-priced items, those that aren't as likely to be price-shopped by your customers, and on those products that don't need to be as competitively priced. But realize that you don't have to wait until the end or the beginning of the year to consider increasing your prices. You may want to consider a price increase when the demand for your product suddenly increases. Perhaps a competitor has raised its prices, or perhaps the law of supply and demand is hard at work. In other words, maybe more demand than supply for the product in question can provide a perfect scenario for raising prices. Don't feel guilty for taking advantage of such situations. You'll encounter plenty of occasions when the law of supply and demand works in reverse and you must cut your prices. Increasing sales. After you have decreased or controlled your expenses and increased your margins, you can now focus on doing what every entrepreneur worth her weight in loan guarantees loves to do, increase sales. After all, increasing sales is what most small business owners are born to do. And besides, offense, increasing sales, is always more enjoyable than defense, cutting expenses. Everyone loves to roll out a new product, Hire a new salesperson. It's usually more fun to hire a salesperson than it is to hire a bookkeeper. Or develop a new sales promotion. What's more, you can easily measure the results of a plan to increase sales. In most cases, the operative word here being most, the act of increasing sales adds profits to your bottom line if those sales are priced at a high enough level to make them profitable. We stress the word most here because small business owners too often attempt to solve their profitability problems by focusing only on increasing sales. What they fail to realize is that if their sales aren't made at a price high enough to generate a profit, then adding more sales will only serve to increase their cumulative losses. Or, stated another way, sales alone don't beget profitability. Only profitable sales do. If you're like most small business owners, you may work without any employees as you transition through the startup stage. Then, after you decide to hire employees, you may find that you need or want only one or two. However, if you have ambitions to really grow your business, you may end up hiring many employees. After all, employees mean leverage, increased means of accomplishing your mission in the world of business and leverage creates all kinds of opportunities for growth. Every business has several game-breaker positions, key positions that will make or break your company. When you're just starting out, the game-breaker positions may be yours alone because you may be the only employee. In larger, established small businesses, those game-breaker positions may include the president, CEO, grand poobah, that's you, the financial person, the sales manager, the marketing manager, the production manager, the office manager, the purchasing agent, the art director, you get the idea. Hiring is mostly science, not art. It's a methodical, repetitive, and often drawn out process. But it's one that most small business owners must go through eventually. The first step in the hiring process is to collect a roster of worthwhile applicants for the position, likely through one of the following methods by running ads, which increasingly is done online, including your own website, by signage at your business, by encouraging referrals from employees, vendors, and customers. Referrals are almost always the best option. 
After all, referred applicants are more likely to be skilled, hard-working applicants because the people doing the referring don't want the embarrassment of referring a weak applicant, and they cost next to nothing. Just get the word out that you're looking, and then let your employees, vendors, and customers do the talking. Remember, never accept an applicant for a key position, one responsible for managing employees, handling money, dealing with customers, and so on, without first obtaining a professionally prepared resume. If the applicant hasn't taken the time to create such a resume, you know right away that he's not right for the position. Exception. When hiring for a part-time position or a minimum wage job, you may receive applicants who don't have resumes. Make sure you have an application form ready for them to fill out. Ask your accountant or any active business for a copy of the form it uses. Also, when hiring key employees for responsible positions, always check to see whether the applicant has a LinkedIn page. If she does, notice how professional the page is. This will give you a clue as to how she will perform her job. Also, check to see whether the two of you have mutual acquaintances. If so, those acquaintances can often provide unbiased referrals. The tough part comes after you've collected the resumes and reviewed the LinkedIn pages. You must interview, then re-interview, and then re-interview again. In other words, go through several rounds of interviews. Never hire someone, no matter how much you are impressed with him, based on just one or even two interviews, meetings, interactions. You must check those often camouflaged references, whose primary function, you soon discover, is to tell you as little as possible about a candidate's faults in between glowing adjectives aimed at his strengths. One of the first things you need to do when you start a business is to purchase insurance. We're talking about liability insurance, auto, fire, theft, business interruption, and so on, as well as workers' compensation insurance. Unfortunately, insurance is an expense that never goes away and generally increases in price every year. Making things worse is the fact that, if you're like most entrepreneurs, after you sign the original policies, you'll file them away and won't consider shopping around to get a better price for long periods of time because you're so busy running your business. In other words, unless you're the exception, the expenses related to insurance policies will be etched on your profit and loss statement as a fixed cost, even though the expenses should be a variable cost, meaning that they should be reviewed every year. Don't even think about entrusting the creation and negotiation of your initial insurance package and the creation of the costs related to it to anyone else. You need to take care of this important task yourself. Liability insurance. In most cases, insurance is a necessary expense, not unlike a host of other necessary expenses, such as rent, telephone, and salaries. In some cases, the justification for insurance is the owner's logic. In other cases, insurance is required by an outsider, a bank, or a property leasing company. Following are the four main categories of liability insurance every small business owner needs to consider. One of them, aptly called liability insurance, is a must. If you don't have liability insurance, a dissatisfied customer or even an on-premise passerby can shut your business down for good. Generally speaking, you can add the other three as your business and its profitability grows to the point where you can afford them. Liability insurance. No telling what may happen on your business premises in these litigious times. Our recommendation, buy enough liability insurance to protect at least twice your combined personal and business net worth. Theft insurance. Sooner or later, someone is going to steal something of value from you. Statistics show that this someone is likely to be an employee. Our recommendation, if you're in the high-ticket retail or wholesale business, automobiles, appliances, and the like, you should purchase theft insurance. You don't need to purchase enough theft insurance to cover all your inventory. Just buy enough to cover what one person can reasonably steal. Otherwise, take your chances until you're profitable especially in the early stages of your business. Property damage insurance. In addition to the physical property you own, rent, or lease, property damage insurance covers your inventory. Similar to homeowner's insurance, 
Property damage insurance is often required by the terms of a lease or bank loan. Our recommendation, if you're in a service business with little expensive equipment and you're leasing or renting in an office building, take your chances if your lease will allow you to do so until you're profitable. Otherwise, buy enough property damage insurance to cover the cost of replacement. Business Interruption Insurance This insurance covers the possibility of your business being halted by any number of random events, most of them being natural disasters. Business Interruption Insurance reimburses you for the profits you don't make during your downtime. Our recommendation. In your business's early stages, you probably won't have much business to interrupt. Spend your scarce money elsewhere. However, this situation, we hope, will change. When it does, business interruption insurance is a must-buy. Your insurance agent can help you determine how much to buy. Some businesses, especially capital-intensive ones, will take a long time to open the doors after an accident or act of God. Other businesses, usually those that sell services, can get back on their feet relatively quickly. Workers' Compensation Insurance Workers' Compensation is payment for insurance that provides benefits in the form of medical expense reimbursement and replacement of lost wages to employees injured on the job. Workers' Compensation is a state-mandated, no-fault insurance system, and, when you have employees, it appears as a hefty expense on your profit and loss statement. Shop around for a trustworthy insurance agent, use referrals from satisfied small business customers, set up a meeting with him or her, along with a representative of the state, your prospective insurance agent can tell you how to locate that person, and find out what you need to do to keep your experience modification factor to a minimum. The experience modification factor is a numerical expression of a company's accident and injury record compared with the average for the firm's industry. The higher your experience modification factor, the higher the cost for workers' compensation insurance. In addition to the experience modification factor, job classification plays an important role in determining the cost of your workers' compensation insurance. The state assigns each job or employee in your small business a particular rating and subsequently a particular premium based on the estimated level of risk involved in the performance of that job. The higher the job classification, the higher the cost for you. Because the classification criteria are often fuzzy, argue for the lower classification when possible. Remember, don't take the job classification process lightly. You can choose from myriad job categories, and a lot of overlap exists among various job categories. You and your business will waste a bunch of insurance money if you don't make the effort to properly classify your employees. Because workers' compensation insurance is a state-run program, ask your insurance agent for the telephone number and address of the applicable state agency if you have questions about the program. Federal taxes, income, Social Security, unemployment, and excise come in a mind-boggling array, as do state and local taxes, income, real estate, sales, and other assorted special levies, depending on your industry. When you're short on cash, don't kid yourself, sooner or later it's bound to happen, make sure that you pay any taxes you owe the government first, even if you have to put off paying your private vendors. Governments, especially the federal government, have an enormous array of collection tools at their disposal, and they have the right to extract a dear price in the form of onerous penalties and interest rates from those who don't follow the letter of the law. So be sure to pay your taxes on time. We hope we're not the first people to tell you this. When you're leasing space for a startup, aim for a two-year lease or three years as an absolute maximum. If you think you may want the space for a longer term, consider negotiating and adding to your lease agreement an escalation clause that stipulates up front how much the rental rate will increase should you choose to extend the lease for a subsequent year or multi-year period. Tip. Unfortunately, reading, understanding, and creating a lease are tasks for lawyers, not laypeople. Pay the legal fees and don't get locked into any long-term leases 
with a lure of free rent or equipment use. Warning. Long-term leases are a no-win situation for the small business owner. If your business grows, it will outgrow the long-term lease, and you'll pay a higher price for its cancellation. If your business doesn't grow, you'll pay an even greater price to get out of the lease. What do we mean by long-term? Any lease for more than two years. Many landlords offer long-term leases, three to five years, with all sorts of exotic discounts. Don't be lured into taking them unless you can afford to pick up the final years out of your own pocket should the business no longer want, need, or be able to pay for the space. The day you hire your first employee is the same day you must create and begin maintaining your first employee personnel folder. Be sure to maintain a written record for every employee covering such issues as employment agreements, including salary history, performance reviews, business goals, commendations, and, of course, reprimands. These records come in handy as you manage and motivate your employees. Such key managerial and motivation tools as goal setting and performance reviews require that you keep detailed employee records for them to work. Also, assuming that you employ living, breathing human beings, you can count on the fact that, sooner or later, you'll have a conflict with one or more of those living, breathing human beings, a conflict that, in the worst case, is likely to end up in court. When a legal battle occurs, the party who can back up his or her claims with the most information usually prevails. Don't be the one who's handicapped by poor record-keeping and documentation, getting licenses and permits. Almost all businesses require filing certain licenses and obtaining particular permits. We define outsourcing as delegating services you don't want to do or don't have time to do to someone outside your company, not an employee, who can usually do them better and faster. The concept of outsourcing isn't new. Businesses have been outsourcing in one form or another for many years. The following list tells you which small business functions are most frequently outsourced. Accounting and bookkeeping. Accounting, the beginning to end process of collecting financial data, generating financial statements, and preparing tax forms, and bookkeeping, the collecting of financial data function only, provide the gamut of outsourcing opportunities. You can, for example, hire someone to do all your accounting and bookkeeping, or you can hire someone to do only your payroll, only your financial statements, or only your tax returns. Because the typical entrepreneur usually isn't well-versed in accounting and bookkeeping skills, we suggest that these functions be among the first you consider for outsourcing. Human resources. As your company grows, the various functions of human resources should be next in line for outsourcing consideration. Human resources includes a wide variety of non-product, non-customer, and non-sales-related issues, such as new employee hiring procedures, policies and procedure manuals for employees, payroll and related information gathering systems, employee training on human resource issues, employee training on a wide variety of sensitive issues, such as ethics and sexual harassment. Manufacturing. The manufacturing process for most products is expensive, time-consuming, and extremely detail-oriented. For many entrepreneurs, especially the creative and or sales types who typically gravitate to this career, outsourcing the manufacturing function makes a lot of sense. Even if your core business is manufacturing, some elements of your product may lend themselves to outsourcing their manufacture to subcontractors. Even behemoth manufacturers, such as General Motors and Apple, subcontract a good deal of their work. Internet Technology, IT most startups, including many in the technology sector themselves, will outsource their IT needs to a local business or independent consultant. The business or consultant you choose will help you purchase and maintain your fleet of computers, servers, and related equipment, help you install your software systems, help you make important technology decisions, such as using the cloud and or determining which operating systems to use that will arise in the everyday course of your business. The best way to find the right firm or consultant? Get referrals from other small business owners who are currently outsourcing their IT.
sales. Outsourcing sales is certainly the most potentially dangerous of the outsourcing options. But some businesses, including those that employ manufacturers' reps, do it. We say potentially dangerous because it's difficult to impart to outside salespeople the enthusiasm and knowledge necessary to effectively sell your business's product or service. Sales is definitely the last of the responsibilities to consider outsourcing, although doing so works well for some small businesses. How do you determine which services to outsource and which ones to retain in-house? Each business and owner is different, of course, but answering the following questions can help you make the best decisions for your situation. Can I better manage my available cash if I outsource? The answer here primarily depends on how much cash you have. For example, by outsourcing the manufacturing process, you avoid the costs associated with maintaining an inventory of raw materials and hiring manufacturing employees. By outsourcing your sales functions, you avoid the costs associated with maintaining a sales force. What do I do best? Because your time is finite, why spend a lot of time doing the things you don't do well, such as bookkeeping and IT, when you can farm out those duties, thereby leaving you with more time to do the things you do well? If you're sales-oriented or product-oriented, for example, doing your business's bookkeeping yourself simply doesn't make sense. Will the cost of the outsourcing tasks include a product or service whose quality is better than what I can produce at that same cost? The answer to this question is often yes, given the fact that the best outsourcing sources are almost always specialists in their areas of expertise. Of course, you shouldn't outsource until you find a competent specialist. What do I enjoy doing the most? We can guarantee you this. If you choose to keep your bookkeeping, human resources, or IT functions in-house, you will, over the years, end up spending no small amount of time dealing with issues related to these functions. Is this the way you want to spend your time? In the final analysis, the decision whether to outsource should be based primarily on what you enjoy spending your time doing and where your personal skill sets lie. The three ways to increase your business's profitability are increasing sales, in which case, those increased sales may or may not have a positive impact on profitability. Increasing prices, in which case the entire amount of the increase will have a positive impact on profitability, assuming that you don't lose customers due to the price increase. Decreasing or controlling expenses, in which case the entire decrease will have a positive impact on profitability assuming that you don't lose business due to the impact of the expense reduction on your product or service quality. Remember, when you increase prices or cut expenses, a one-to-one -one leverage factor goes to work on your bottom line profits. This is why successful small business owners always look to the expense and pricing categories first when they're in a profitability crunch. Results can be instantaneous, and the impact is usually dollar on dollar. Whether you're starting a new company or running an existing one, you must remember that controlling expenses is a cultural issue, and cultural issues begin at the top. We're talking about the old practice of leading by example. If you have overstuffed chairs in your office and idle secretaries in your foyer, your employees are going to demonstrate a similar penchant for spending unnecessary money. As a small business owner, you have to control two kinds of expenses. Fixed expenses, those expenses that don't fluctuate with sales, including such categories as insurance, rent, equipment leases, interest, and taxes. You usually negotiate them in the startup stage and then leave them alone until the original negotiations lapse and you have to renegotiate them. Such periods may be anywhere from one year to five years. Effective control of fixed expenses requires your skillful negotiation, because after they're established, negotiation time probably won't come around for a while, which means you're stuck with them. Variable expenses. Those expenses that fluctuate with sales. As sales go up, variable expenses go up as well, and vice versa. These expenses include cost of goods sold, 
sales commissions, and outbound freight. You can delegate the determination of the prices to be paid for variable expenses as long as you remember that the responsibility for controlling them, in the early stages of a business anyway, should always rest with you, the owner. You need to approve all purchase orders and sign all checks that relate to variable expenses. As the company grows, you may choose to delegate the responsibility for controlling expenses to other responsible individuals inside the company. Or you may choose to maintain control by continuing to sign the checks and questioning the invoices that support those checks. Definitely our recommendation. Tip. A key to controlling expenses is keeping your employees cost conscious. If your employees know that you and other key managers will question unreasonable or unnecessary expenses, they, too, will be motivated to be cost-conscious. You can also use incentives to help you cut costs. If you give your employees a reason, bonus, perks, recognition, to look for unnecessary costs, they're sure to find them. As you manage your expenses, always be aware of the 80-20 rule, which says that you can find 80% of your wasted expense dollars in 20% of your expense categories. For businesses that have a significant number of employees, the wages and salary account is usually the largest expense category and, thus, the most often abused. We don't mean to say that you shouldn't challenge expenses in every category. You can usually find some wasted dollars by rooting around in such expense accounts as utilities, travel insurance, and, of course, the compost heap, the miscellaneous expense account. Remember. Effective expense control is not only a profitability issue, but also an important element for controlling cash flow. Because lack of cash is usually the number one warning signal of a small business's impending troubles or failure, one of the best ways to build a solid foundation for your business is by controlling your expenses from the very beginning. Budgeting, also known as forecasting, is the periodic, usually annual review of past financial information with the purpose of forecasting future financial conditions. If you've completed your business plan, you, in effect, prepared your first budget when you forecasted your profit and loss statement for the upcoming year. The only difference in preparing a budget for your ongoing business is that you now enjoy the advantage of having yesterday's figures to work with. Incidentally, the process of budgeting is one that should apply not only to your business, but also to your personal finances, especially if you have trouble saving money. If you aren't currently budgeting your personal revenues and expenses, start doing so now. After all, there's no better way to prepare yourself for running a business than to begin at home. In your small business, you have two ways to budget expenses from year to year. The first, we call this adjusted for inflation budgeting, is to assume a percentage increase for each expense category, both variable and fixed. For example, say that you decide that your telephone expense, a variable expense, will increase by 5% next year, your rent, a fixed expense, will remain the same, and your advertising and promotion, a variable expense, will increase by 10%. The other way to budget expenses is called zero-based budgeting. If you use this type of budgeting, you assume that last year's expenses were zero and begin the budgeting process from that point. For example, the zero-based formula assumes that your supplies expense account begins at zero. Thus, you must first determine who consumed what supplies last year, who will be consuming them this year, and how much will be consumed. Then you must determine what price you'll pay for this year's supplies. In this manner, zero-based budgeting forces you to annually manage your consumption at the same time that you review your costs. The effect of zero-based budgeting is that you no longer include prior year's mistakes in the current year's budgets. For example, when you budget telephone expenses for the year, instead of increasing them by a flat percentage, zero-based budgeting demands that you make sure your prior year's bill was the lowest it could be. This assumption forces you to determine 
who's using your phones for what kind of activity, and also to reprice your rates with telephone carriers. Instead of forecasting a 5% increase, you may well end up projecting a 5% decrease. The zero-based method also assumes that you'll check out prices with other vendors besides the ones that you're presently using. Remember, far too many small businesses don't budget expenses at all. Furthermore, of those small business owners who do, few use zero-based budgeting despite its many advantages. Not budgeting is truly one of the most expensive mistakes you can make as a small business owner. Sure, zero-based budgeting may take more time than using a percentage, but it can pay big dividends in increasing bottom-line profitability at home or in your business. A small business's most underrated priority is working with its vendors, suppliers. Think about it. Without a good vendor, what would happen to your business? Say you own a computer retail store. Where would you be without Apple, Hewlett-Packard, and Microsoft on your shelves? Not into computers? Say you run a restaurant. Where would you be without a reliable baker, meat supplier, and fresh vegetable resource to depend on? Every successful business owner has learned the importance of having a cadre of loyal vendors standing behind his or her business. Yet few small businesses have the muscle or the clout to demand any significant degree of vendor loyalty, which means that they must build strong vendor relationships the old-fashioned way, by earning them. The following tips provide information on how to earn favored relationships with your vendors. Don't nickel and dime your vendors. Agree on the details of your business arrangement, price, delivery, and terms, and then try to work within those parameters for the agreed-upon time frame. Occasional exceptions will occur. Whatever you do, don't use the low-ball pricing of the latest vendor on the street as leverage against the long-time reliable vendor unless you're prepared to lose or greatly annoy the long-time reliable one. Pay your bills on time. Paying your bills within the designated period of time helps maintain favored customer status. After all, isn't prompt payment what you expect of your customers? Save your special favor requests for when you need them. Don't cry wolf on requests for out-of-the-ordinary service. Save those requests for crunch time. Treat your vendor's representatives, sales, or customer service employees as you want your own employees to be treated. The golden rule is alive and well when it comes to maintaining vendor relationships. Remember that relationships matter. Everyone these days is preaching relationships, relationships, relationships when dealing with customers, right? Well, the same thing applies with vendors. Work to build a solid relationship with yours. If your vendor is a national supplier, build a relationship with its local or regional salesperson or representative or the person at the other end of the phone line. If your vendor is a local supplier, get to know him or her personally, just as you would a local customer. And remember, your bankers are vendors too, perhaps the most important ones of all. Remember, vendors, especially the good ones, can provide you with more than just a product or service. For instance, vendors can be a great source of new business referrals. They can also provide training to both your employees and, on some occasions, your customers, a form of assistance that typical small businesses can't get enough of. Dealing with bankers, lawyers, and other outsiders. Bankers. Ask the typical small business owner what she thinks about bankers, and you'll usually get a reaction somewhere between a roll of the eyes and a hair-tearing tantrum. As a rule, bankers get a bad rap from the small business community, especially since the banking problems of the 2008 financial crisis. Remember, when bankers say no, they're only doing what they're trained to do, protect their depositors' money. A key part of the banker's job description is not taking big risks. Think about it. If bankers were creative and optimistic and prone to take risks, they'd be entrepreneurs, not bankers. Everyone has a role in a capitalistic system. Being safe and conservative just happens to be the role of the banker. Make no mistake about it. Startups are the riskiest of risks.
which is why bankers don't usually consider financing them, unless the collateral is right. Meanwhile, especially in recent years, a variety of small business below-market lenders have appeared on the scene, and today numerous viable alternatives exist for finding startup capital. Although bankers may not play an important role in the startup, after the business is up and running, their role can become more crucial, especially when the small business experiences rapid growth. Expansion often requires operating capital in the form of outside financing, which is where bankers come in. On occasion, of course, the entrepreneur may go back to her original source of operating capital. More typically, however, she gets her financing through bank loans. Here's how we recommend that you work with bankers. Help your banker do her job. Call her more often than she calls you, not just with the good news, but also with the bad. Bankers don't like surprises, especially bad ones. Always ask for more money than you think you need. A little insurance never hurt anybody, and you usually won't get everything you ask for anyway. Besides, going back to the well a second time can be difficult as well as embarrassing. Prepare in advance for your banker's visits. No matter what she says, your banker isn't paying social calls on you. She's kicking your tires. Include an agenda and a tour of your facilities and then review your financial results before she asks you for them. Finally, follow up your banker's visit with a letter outlining your discussion and thanking her for her time. Recognize that you're probably going to have to personally guarantee, legally obligate your personal assets as collateral, your business's loans. After all, you're asking your banker to, in effect, deposit her firm's money into your business. If you were in your banker's shoes, wouldn't you ask for such a guarantee? Remember, however, that your guarantee is only one of many issues that are up for negotiation when you're borrowing money. Try to use your personal guarantee to get an offsetting concession, something in return for your benefit, in the lending agreement. Don't lose sight of the fact that a bank's interest rate, the collateral it requires, and the terms it outlines are negotiable. What you settle on depends on the strength of your bargaining position. Don't blindly accept everything the banker offers. Shop around among various banks that do small business lending. Be prepared to answer the bank's tough questions, especially where your assets are concerned. The banker will want to know more about such hard assets as inventory, receivables, and equipment than you ever thought possible. But remember, those assets are the bank's insurance. The better your business assets look to the bank, the better your negotiating position will be when the time comes to work out the terms of the loan. Remember, bankers and their conservative, close-to-the-vest ways are a fact of life. You can either learn to live with them or face life without being able to borrow their money. Tip. Look at your local community banks first because they have historically taken the lead in small business lending. Lawyers. Consulting a lawyer has a time and a place. Lawyers provide protection, often against other lawyers, and force you to make plans to guard against the downsides that your entrepreneurially optimistic nature may overlook. Remember, yes, lawyers definitely have a time and a place. The place is always in the lawyer's office, you can't afford to pay a lawyer to travel to your office or on the phone. And the times are when forming your corporation or LLC, when taking in a partner or partners, when creating shares of stock in your company for you and for others, when signing a lease, contract, or binding agreement, when buying or selling a business, when dealing with someone else's attorney on a conflictive issue, when creating an employee handbook, when designing employee bonus programs that result in company ownership for the employees, when dealing with a situation that can result in expensive litigation, such as terminating a long-time or problematic litigious employee, when considering bankruptcy. We hope that never happens. No matter how much you want to avoid the expense of consulting with a lawyer, you should definitely hire one at the startup stage and on the preceding occasions throughout the life of your business. When these occasions present themselves, 
we suggest you follow these tips for how best to find and utilize your lawyer. When you absolutely, positively have to find a lawyer, don't shop just for price. Shop for quality and price. As with cars and quarterbacks, lawyers differ greatly in the way they perform, and that difference usually translates into winning or losing. Check references closely, just as you would when hiring a key employee. Get a quote on your prospective lawyer's hourly fees and ask for an estimate of the total tab in advance. The estimate may not hold up, but the lawyer will know that you're watching. Always ask for itemized invoices. A lump sum invoice includes only time and rate, while an itemized invoice includes the date and time of each segment of work, the specific subject of each charge, and then the hourly rate. An itemized invoice also indicates work that was done by others, paralegals, for example, along with their hourly rates and charges for related materials. Don't let lawyers chit-chat about anything other than the business at hand if their meters are running. Even though you enjoy talking about the latest sports or TV news as much as the next person, keep your discussions with your lawyer focused on your business. After all, we'd hate for you to pay $250 an hour to talk football. Keep in mind that lawyers are human beings too, which means they aren't always right. Lawyers work in a gray profession not a black and white one. The power of logic, theirs and yours, working in unison with their knowledge of the law, will play a significant role in your business. You're capable of logic, too. Don't be afraid to use it in their presence. If your lawyers won't listen to you or ask for your input with important decisions, then find another lawyer. Don't be afraid to fire lawyers when they fail to perform up to your expectations. They're no different from employees, accountants, or anyone else you hire to provide a service. Tip. Lawyers aren't the only resource for settling disputes. Many small businesses today utilize mediation to resolve contentious issues with customers, suppliers, and employees. Mediation is significantly less expensive than litigation and can take a fraction of the time. No court dates, no judges, and no miles of red tape. Tax advisors. Tax advisors, like lawyers, are professionals. The services they provide aren't rooted in conflict, but hiring and paying them can be equally discomforting and almost as expensive. The role of tax advisors, in essence, is to provide you with the information you need to pay your taxes, make tax-wise business decisions, keep score of your progress, and manage your business. Consultants. Hiring a consultant is akin to playing wild card poker, meaning that fate will be a factor in determining whether you select the right one. That's not to say your success or failure is entirely in fate's hands, because the more effort you put into the hiring process, the better your chances will be to get the job done right. Consultants can provide a wide array of services. Several of the areas where consultants can help the most include computer and information systems, tax issues, human resources, sales, and marketing. You'll find more than one way to use and pay consultants. Some consultants offer their clients advice only. Other consultants dive headfirst into their clients' business and get their hands dirty. Some consultants are paid by the hour, others by retainer, a fixed fee every month. It all depends on what you want and what you can afford. Here are a few tips for how to get the most out of your consultant. Search for a consultant as if you were hiring a key staff employee. Network to find the best one and always check references carefully. Avoid consultants who have had only big corporate as opposed to small business experience. Despite what they tell you, most don't understand what running a small business is like. Hire only consultants with plenty of small business experience. Whatever you do, don't hand over to your consultants the responsibility of making key decisions. Also, never bet the house on the suggestions they make. Make your consultants prove themselves on smaller issues before you make the bigger changes they recommend. And never forget that you're in charge. 
Don't offer any long-term contracts. Build in a quick exit option in the all-too-likely event that you don't get what you expected. And don't hesitate to show consultants the door when they aren't doing the job. Or, as the old adage goes, hire them slowly, fire them quickly. Understand that their fees are only part of the ultimate cost of engaging ineffectual consultants. Add misdirection, upset employees, and time lost, and consultants can run up monumental tabs in surprisingly short periods of time. Governments. If only entrepreneurs understood that the government is often an uncontrollable random event, like a fire or a flood or a competitor moving in next door. This is especially true of the federal government, where the small business owner may find it quite difficult to so much as talk to those officials who are the actual decision makers, let alone get their problems resolved. Remember, come to terms with the fact that you'll sometimes have to comply with the government's unwieldy and often unfriendly rules and regulations. Don't antagonize government employees, especially those who work for the IRS. They can make your life miserable. Do what needs to be done to satisfy those sometimes disagreeable government employees. You'd probably be disagreeable too if you had to spend your life in their environment. Treat the agreeable ones like you'd want your own employees to be treated and don't shoot the messenger. Most government employees are only trying to do their jobs. Training. Training is generally recognized as the most efficient and least expensive answer to employee improvement. Unfortunately, however, training remains close to the bottom of too many small business owners' priority lists. Too often, small business owners view training as an expense rather than as an investment that comes back in the form of increased productivity. We've heard too many small business owners complain about the cost of training, especially when that training results in the employee moving on to greener pastures and taking her knowledge with her. Although such occurrences do take place, part of the reason that employees move on is because they don't get the opportunity to receive the training they need. Besides, as the old saying goes, if you think training employees and watching them leave is expensive, try not training them and watching them stay. Training comes in many forms and from various sources. Unlike many large companies, which generate much of their training from in-house sources, small business training usually comes from the outside. Here are your major training options. Consultants and coaches. Although consultants and coaches have the most potential as trainers, they're also the most expensive and riskiest. Vendors. Vendors can be an excellent resource for training, and they're less costly than consultants. Some vendors even provide free training on their products or services. Seminars and webinars. Seminars and webinars can be expensive in both dollars and time, and their potential value is difficult to predict. Good ones are great bargains. Bad ones are outlandish scams. The seminars and webinars with the best potential, and usually the least expensive, are those put on by your trade association, which are geared to the industry you're in. Continuing education. This category includes universities, colleges, night schools, online courses such as Coursera, Skillshare, or Udemy, and vocational training. Although continuing education is probably more dependable than seminars, the value is also difficult to predict. The benefit of the course depends largely on the quality of the instructor. Consider offering a tuition reimbursement program, whereby you reimburse employees' expenses for outside studies related to the business. The benefits to the company from such a program include goodwill, the development of a self-improvement culture, and the infusion of new ideas in its employees. Require a B grade or better for reimbursement to be paid after the course is completed. Books. Books are a great value. In fact, a good book is the ultimate training bargain. Read it, or have your employees read it, between projects, Put it down when you please and refer to it always. Keep it forever or pass it on to a friend or another employee. If you extract and implement one good idea, the $20 or so you spent is quickly repaid many times over. Every good idea after the first one is a bonus, 
audio and video courses fall into this same category. Everyone can use goals as a motivational tool, and not just when relating to the workplace. You can also use goals in raising kids, pursuing financial security, and improving your golf game. And we're not talking lighthearted New Year's resolutions here. We're talking goals, as in commitments to objectives. Although the purpose of this section is to assist you in working with your employees to set goals that will motivate them, these suggestions can also help you with your own personal goals. Remember, LIFO, FIFO, CRM, TQM. Acronyms are everywhere these days. Even goal setting comes with its own acronym, SMART. And here's how it works. S equals specific. Goals must be clear, direct, and definable. M equals measurable and meaningful. Goals must be measurable in the sense that both employer and employee can assess whether the goal is achieved. And, of course, goals must be meaningful to both parties. A equals appropriate. Goals should be appropriate to the employee's experience, training, potential, and responsibilities. R equals realistic. Goals should challenge but be achievable. 80% of the goal should be relatively easy to meet. 20% should be a stretch. T equals time limit. Goals should be achievable within a specified time frame. Warning. The two biggest mistakes business owners make when setting goals for themselves, their businesses, and their employees are creating goals that aren't measurable and including a non-specific time frame for the goals. Consider the following examples. Non-smart goal. Increase sales and increase profitability by working smarter and harder. This goal isn't measurable, and it doesn't specify a time frame in which to measure it. Smart goal. Increase sales by 15% and increase profitability by 20% by the end of this fiscal year. Are these goals measurable? Yes. Is it a workable time frame? Yes. Are they achievable? You make the call. The following list outlines how you and your employees can set and achieve SMART goals. Never set goals without first planning how to reach them. For instance, wanting to increase sales by 15% isn't enough. You must have a game plan for how to do so. Don't wait until the end of the goal-setting period to do the measuring. Check progress periodically and informally as the mood strikes and formally at defined time intervals between now and the end of the goal-setting period. Allow for the unexpected. Changing goals midstream is acceptable if the reasons are right. Since the success of a small business is, in part, due to being able to make changes faster than its larger competitors, you should always build the likelihood of change into your goal-setting procedures. Make a public announcement within the business, occasionally outside of the business, when the goals reached are extraordinary, as soon as your business or your employees have achieved goals. Let the celebration begin. Let it be spontaneous and let it be loud. Understand that an employee may occasionally come up short on his goals. What's not okay is for an employee to consistently come up short. In that event, something is wrong with either the employee or the goal-setting process. Remember, effective goal-setting should be a communal, bottoms-up process. The more involved your employees are in establishing their goals, the more committed they'll be to achieving them. Ask each employee to prepare her goals first and then review them together, hone them together, and be sure to write them down, giving one copy to the employee and adding a second to her personnel file. Documenting goals makes the goal-setting process official and minimizes potential misunderstandings when performance review time comes around. Although some companies may get by without using performance expectations or the old-fashioned job descriptions, we think that most small business owners would agree that employees need some degree of structure in their jobs. Performance expectations provide that structure. Used correctly, they provide a loose but reliable framework to help the employee focus on the results of his activities, not on the activity itself. That's the key difference between job descriptions and performance expectations. Job descriptions 
focus on the activity of the position. Performance expectations focus on the anticipated results. For example, say a typical job description states that a salesperson is responsible for selling the company's products at the published prices, writing sales orders correctly, and making sure that the sales orders are submitted within a specified time. A performance expectation for the same position would require the salesperson to represent her company professionally. It would define the word professional, build ongoing relationships with customers and buyers, and assist the entire business team in realizing the specified departmental goals. Writing performance expectations isn't as difficult as you may think. Here's how the writing process works. Include a brief explanation of what the position's objective or mission is and how the position relates to the business's overall mission. This explanation should appear at the beginning of the performance expectations. Describe the position's location on the organization chart. Include the immediate supervisor's title and the positions, if any, of those being supervised. Define the performance evaluation process. Who will perform the evaluation, when will it be done, and on what basis will the employee's performance be appraised? Concentrate on output, not activity, and be careful not to limit the ways in which the job can be accomplished. Define the responsibilities and allow the employee the freedom to make the job work. Be flexible. The world and your business will change, and your performance expectations need to change right along with them. Remember, employees aren't robots. The biggest mistake you can make is to develop performance expectations that restrict the employee's performance options. You should write the performance expectations before you advertise for the position. Then, after you've hired the new employee, review the performance expectations together and agree on the expected results. Try to avoid the number one headache of most employees, micromanagement. Give your employees the leeway to achieve the desired results without constantly looking over their shoulders. How important is the performance review? Consider this. You're assigning a value to someone's existence in a place where he likely spends more than 50% of his waking hours during the work week. If performance reviews aren't important, breathing isn't either. Warning. The biggest problem with performance reviews is that the typical entrepreneur perceives the review as an opportunity to criticize the employee's performance rather than to improve it. Sure, criticism of past performance may be part of the review process, but so is the positive critique of performance. Everything you do in the performance review, including criticizing past performance and increasing compensation, is a means to improving future performance, not punishing or complaining about past performance. Good performance reviews don't just happen. They evolve as a result of a well-defined evaluation process that includes writing performance expectations. Before you even hire an employee, you must establish written, meaningful standards by which to measure performance. Setting goals. You must work with each employee to establish and agree on applicable SMART goals. You should develop these goals as soon as the employee is comfortably settled in her new job. Creating critical event memos. You must document all critical events in an employee's day-to-day -day performance and file them in the employee's personnel file at the time they occur. That way, you can use them at review time to add objective support to your subjective observations. These critical event memos should include occurrences of positive as well as negative behavior. Because the purpose of reviews is to improve performance, you can usually earn more motivational mileage by pointing out the employee's successes than you can by itemizing her failures. Providing interim feedback. In between performance reviews, you should informally and regularly give employees feedback. Thus, by the time the next performance review comes around, the employee shouldn't have any surprises. If you're consistent in providing feedback to your employees, you'll give them plenty of time in between reviews to work on improving their behavior. Conducting the Annual Performance and Salary Review At last, the main event. Now's the time to compare actual performance 
with expectations and goals, review critical event memos, assign new wages, and agree on bonuses and perks, all the while discussing goals and expectations for the future. Remember that the purpose of all these tasks is to motivate the employee to improve her performance in the upcoming period. Scheduling the follow-up review. You should hold follow-up reviews either quarterly or semi-annually, although if the situation is dire enough, you can hold them monthly until the employee's performance has improved to your expectations. These follow-up reviews should be informal but well-prepared and designed to provide feedback on the employee's progress since the annual review. The employee evaluation process is a natural progression that begins with performance expectations and goal setting and ends with the performance and salary review and the follow-up review. The performance review itself is but one piece of the process. Without the other pieces, the evaluation is incomplete. Don't expect earth-shattering results from performance reviews if you aren't willing to adopt the entire process. Following are guidelines for providing effective performance reviews. Hold the official review once a year. Conduct the review either on the employee's hiring anniversary or sometime around the beginning of your business's fiscal year. Schedule the review well in advance, giving both parties plenty of time to prepare. No phones, no interruptions. Go off-site if you expect the review to be stressful. Prepare for the review with the same thoroughness as you would for any other important business meeting. Keep in mind that reviews are benchmarks in the employee's career. Begin each review with a generous helping of compliments, citing specific accomplishments and good work. Get things off to a positive start. Reinforce the intent of the review early to improve the employee's performance. Evaluate the employee based on the past year's performance, not just the past months. We're talking long-term careers here, not short-term trends. Back up subjective comments with objective facts and stories. These should come from the critical event memos you've retained in the employee's personnel file. Keep it a performance review, not a character review. Keep personalities out of it. Discuss changes in compensation after you critique the employee's performance, but before you solicit feedback from the employee about the company. Once the compensation issue has been broached, ask how he feels about the way the company is being run and what aspects can be better managed. Remember, the timing here is important. You won't get frank feedback from most employees until they have the assurance in the form of a pay change commitment from you that constructive or negative comments won't get in the way of their pay increase. When a pay increase is not being granted, make sure that the employee knows exactly why an increase won't be forthcoming and then conclude the review by asking the employee if he understands why. Also, be sure he knows when the next opportunity for pay increases will come and what he and the business must do to get his performance up to the level where he can expect an increase. Dealing with failure. The best way to judge the immediate results of a performance review is by observing and asking how the employee feels about the review and the change in compensation. If the employee is visibly upset and goes away angry, the review is a failure. If she goes away appearing to be motivated, the review is, at least temporarily, a success. If the review is a failure, if you perceive that the employee doesn't go away from the review motivated, one of two things may have happened. You didn't conduct the review correctly. If this is the case, we recommend that you try again a week or so later after upgrading your presentation and explaining to the employee that you made some mistakes you'd like to correct. Yes, bosses and owners are human. They make mistakes too. You performed the review correctly, but the employee falls into the category of people who simply can't take criticism, constructive or otherwise. If this is the case, the employee may not be the right person for the job. Observe the employee's performance over the next few weeks to watch for signs of improvement. If you don't see any, you may need to schedule a formal follow-up review or start considering termination.